All right, people, we are live on the YouTube. I've got the lobster and I've got the hair. It sounds like some sort of 70s, is that, could that be a rock band or is that like, uh, this could be some kind of violent flick or a mafia movie or something? Or a violent rock band. A violent rock band, yeah, all right. I've wanted to get you guys together. You two have never been seen on camera before. I think that's true. As far as you know. I, I did appear in, in right. front of Jordan, but uh, we never intersected on stage at the Masonic when you decided I should open. Uh, when you played yeah. your mean harmonica? The harmonica solo. <laughs> yeah. Out of all yeah. the zany moments that we've had in the last two months, <laughs> would you say that bringing Eric Weinstein, mathematician, out on stage at the Masonic to play the harmonica and have 3,000 people give him a standing ovation, would that be the top? That, that was good. That was good. It worked really well, too, because he turned out he actually could play the harmonica, yeah. which is a good thing if you're going to try it in front of 3,000 people. Well, I, it was but, a first for me. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't play in front of a smaller crowd before. That, so that was, uh, that was a bit of a, an eye-opener. It was yeah. pretty sweet. All right, it was so, a good night. Yeah. All right. I want to cover 100% new stuff for, for the next two hours. There's a, a bunch of stuff, obviously, that we've been hitting on on tour and uh, some things that we've been sort of catching up on as this has all been going on. So I thought the place to start, I think, would be something that I've been starting a lot of the shows with when I go out there and I do a little intro and I get everybody going, warming up for, for Jordan, the idea that we're starting to win. And when I've been saying win, there's a feeling in the crowd of like, whoa, maybe all of this madness that we've all been talking about for all these years, maybe enough people have woken up now that there is something shifting. So I've brought that up a bunch, and you've sort of picked up on it on a couple of the shows mm -hmm. and talked about why winning isn't necessarily the way we should view this, or what winning actually is. So I thought that would be a good place to, to kick us off here. Well, it's, I, it's more what winning actually is, you know, because one of the things that has to be contended with in the current situation is that, especially in the United States, but also in the rest of the Western world, there's a political divide. And Americans have been voting 50% Republican and 50% Democrat for four elections pretty much split right down the middle and there, there can't be any final victory by one side over the other because everyone has to live together so the victory is how can we continue to live together peacefully and productively and 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 we have to figure out the pathway forward to that but then i think there's another kind of victory that that's deeper than that that's on the horizon which is that i think the narrative that underlies our culture as a whole has to shift and I started to think about this when I was working for a UN committee about five years ago I worked on a committee on sustainability for the Secretary General and um, I had a chance with the people that I was working for and with in Canada to rewrite the underlying narrative because it was very pessimistic it was a real Cold War narrative North against South and capitalists against socialists and doom and gloom on the horizon and it seemed to me to be outdated really by about 40 years and I started to read a lot of the economic development and ecology literature and mostly what I found was that things are getting better globally so fast and on so many different dimensions that it's almost inconceivable and yet no one seems to know that and in the aftermath of that there's been about six books published in the last five years that like Pinker's book Enlightenment Now. I think we now, got it right over here right, somewhere, yeah. Right, but, but, uh, but by no means, that's by no means the only book detailing out a revolution in living standard progress and and ecological progress for that matter around the world so i think there's two victories to be held here to be had here one is to pull us everyone out of the pessimistic apocalyptic cold war narrative that enveloped us for four or five decades and to notice that the future could actually be bright if we were careful and the second is to make sure that the political dialogue in the west doesn't polarized to the degree that we start doing things that are fatally stupid. Yeah, all right, so let's talk about the second part first, because I think that's where we've really been focusing, the, the political part. So uh, it's interesting to note these 50-50 uh, divides. I, I, I don't think that's a reason. I, I guess I have a, a, a strongly different take, and maybe, maybe it's the same. Yeah. Um, we'll have to figure that out. T to me, the 50-50 mark is going to more or less hold as long as these two parties can calculate uh, what's the maximum they can, uh, what, what's the minimum they have to give up to win an election. And so the, the key issue is what does the 50-50 composition look like? And unfortunately what it keeps looking like is the two parties becoming more and more 
uh, nightmarish uh, in my mind and less trustworthy. So we, we, the 50-50 mm. continues to hold, but, but what it represents is a tension uh, the tension is, increases. Is getting much worse. Mm -hmm. And so the key issue is that those of us who are sort of center, I mean, I, I don't love the left right spectrum, but let's just use it as shorthand that the center left and the center right have to see each other as our natural allies. And the center left has to clean house and get rid of the nutty left. And the mm -hmm. center right has to get rid of the far right. And that's the, the, mm -hmm. the optimistic scenario. Mm -hmm. I think winning is incredibly important. Okay, well, that's a good, interesting way of conceptualizing it. Let me so, go a little bit further. Yep, sure. I think that we have to stop being apologetic about winning and what winning means. Winning means that the advance guard of the uh, radical center uh, has to make this a safe and habitable space again. Mm -hmm. And so in order to do that, um, and the reason I you know, tr try to focus mostly, most of my negative energy on the left is, is that it's my responsibility to clean house on the radical, bad, progressive mo movement that is almost certainly going to fuel the far right. Mm -hmm. It's not efficient for me to go after the far right because I mean, of course, I'm going to be anti-Nazi and anti-skinhead, right? Mm -hmm. But well, we've we've talked about that a lot too, because when we do the events, you know, you, all these hit pieces that come out, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Well, when they say that your audience is all these angry white men yeah. and all of this nonsense, which every night it is proven to be false. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, yeah, you address that every night talking mm -hmm. about the bad identity politics of the right, but mm -hmm. it's not something that well, fully. Well, the, the thing that's strange and that that ties into what what you're saying as well is that. It isn't obvious to me who the dangerous right are. You know, it's obvious to me who the dangerous left are because they occupy the universities. But well, it's not just the universities. This is, an, I mean, this is so misthunk, if you will, that we have to really break the frame and and, and reweave it. So um, the journalists keep saying, "Oh, you you guys are focusing on a tiny problem afflicting a few uh, universities that mostly nobody's ever heard of." Yeah, that's that, definitely that, not true. Well, yeah. the first thing is is that it deflects the problem from the the number one problem isn't the universities, it's journalism. And so the idea is that the journalists are saying, "You guys are complaining about uh, this small story in the universities." Like, no, no, you're getting it wrong. We're complaining about the number one story, which is the sense-making uh, apparatus having gone haywire. Mm -hmm. And if you think about these journalists that we're now dealing with as like the hermit crabs that have crawled into the shells that we used to know, hmm. right? Yes, so yes, whether exactly. CNN or NPR or National Review or whatever these structures are, it's a different group of hermit crabs. The yeah. shells are the same. And the great danger is, is that if you recognize the font uh, at the top of the LA Times and the New York mm -hmm. Times, you think you're getting a, a, the same product, but the product has become radically different. Uh, and there was a problem back then. I'm not saying that, it, that, that, that there wasn't. And, you know, of course, the, the issue is that when we criticize journalists now, they think we are criticizing journalism. Far from it. We are praying for journalism, right. the yes, return right. of journalism. Exactly. And the idea is, is that we are fighting this thing where they've got their fingers so clearly on the scale that the, everything is being tipped and what you're getting is a more distorted reality. There's some mm -hmm. point at which, and we have to talk about what happened with, I don't know how to pronounce it best, iatrogenics in medicine, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. idea that doctors are creating a, created a huge amount of the harm done, uh, found in hospitals. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, when medical you start, errors are the fourth leading cause of death. Right. Yeah. So now we have to talk not about iatrogenics, which is the, you know, the, the, that which originates from the healers, but journogenics, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is what is the harm done to the truth by journalists? And okay, that so, is... So I have a, 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 a technological slant on that to some degree, because one of the things that I think is happening, because I've watched large organizations degenerate, because I've worked as a consultant for a a lot of years now. It's really interesting to see how fast a, a, a large organization that you think is semi-permanent can disintegrate. It can happen, well, certainly within the span of a couple of years and sometimes a lot faster Weeks. than that. Yes, well, and I think one of the things that seems to be happening to me is that as television dies under the weight of YouTube primarily, but let's say online video and perhaps also podcasts, is that the, the remaining journalists, the hermit crabs who occupy the old shells, which is a good way of thinking about it, get increasingly desperate for attention. And so they're pushed by economic pressure in some mm -hmm. sense and situational pressure to exaggerate the danger. It's like, and it's a clickbait phenomena, essentially. And it seems to me to be akin to what's happened with, with reports on the crime rate. 
So, you know, over the last 25 years, the five major indices of violent crime have declined by 50 percent, which is absolutely, in, in, in the United States, staggering decrease. But the rate of reporting of violent crime has uh -huh. gone up substantially. And so people think that things are more dangerous now than they were, even though they're safer now than they have been since the early 60s, and they were safer then than they'd ever been in history. So I think one of the things, and, it, and it's interesting to think about the technological forces driving this, because YouTube and podcasts do pose a fatal threat, I mm -hmm. would say, certainly to, to, to television. And so it makes sense to me that as the journalists become less professional and less in demand and their message is, has, has, is, is chasing a diminishing audience, that they're going to get noisier and noisier about what's going on. And the trick for everyone else who's being immersed in that is to stay sane and sensible while the death throes play themselves out. So yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't you naturally think, though, that more of them would start seeing this? I mean, what we now see so clearly and that more of them would be jumping ship? Or is that old shell so tainted or corroded that getting out of that thing well, is, is almost impossible? It has to do with systems of selective pressure. So Jordan raises an excellent point that uh, the dying throes uh, of an institution tend to be its most violent because it's in go for broke mode and it's not worrying about tomorrow, it's worrying about maybe serve up, you know, buying another month or two or who knows right, what. Right, right, right. But there's another issue, of course, which is that the formats are set uh, so that your news comes to you in a form that is more or less the same every day and so you know how to consume it. Mm -hmm. So everybody who listens to NPR has a pre-grooved uh, template in their brain, I'm going to get the top stories at the top of the hour, and then there are going to be this many pieces, and there'll be like a feel-good story, and so you right. know exactly yeah. what you're going to get, and like here, Have we don't it. know what we're going to get, maybe Jordan and I are going to come to blow, something yeah. could yeah. happen. We're yeah. open. You've got to change the drink. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that uh, is, is that in the system of selective pressures, as the business model fails, you have a fascinating phenomenon which people who are willing to accept um, strange uh, r uh, blends of payment. So lower financial payment and security, uh, job security, but higher psychic payment stemming from the idea that they are crusading mm -hmm. uh, are going to start to dominate. So you're seeing many more people who are willing to substitute activism and the sense that they are protagonists in a great story uh, about the resistance, let's say. Yeah. Uh, those right, so that, that actually becomes more and more necessary as the stability and, and the viability of the system degenerates. Right, if you could right. offer um, you know, $200,000 salaries to uh, good reporters uh, in short order so that they could start families and buy homes and, and have an easier life, like one of the things that you need to do is you need to pay people more if you're unhappy with them. And this, I think, mm -hmm. I learned I've thought about that about professors, actually, that well, if professor sociology professors had their salaries tripled, they'd be a lot less radically. I learned right. this from the New Orleans <laughs> Police Department, where at some point they had uh, corruption, where people were ordering uh, mob-style hits over police radio. And I think what happened was that the new police chief came in and he said the first thing he did was raise salaries. Mm -hmm. And the idea being that you have to have skin in the game, thanks to Nassim Taleb, yeah. is that phrase is uh, proliferated, thanks Nassim, wherever you are. Um, and you need to give people something to defend. And so it's very important to pay the people that we are um, decrying all the time yeah, more so money. Yes, so we could say um, everybody who's listening should go online and donate to Quillette's Patreon page. Yeah, Quillette's doing great work. Reason. Quillette is doing great work. But I'm saying that we should, we should try to figure out how to get Vox more money as well. Mm -hmm. And we should try to figure out how to get Slate and Salon and all of these things so that you can afford to pay people in ways in which they don't have to take a large portion of their payment as psychic gratification mm -hmm. from having felled imaginary dragons. But just to be clear there when you're saying that, um, you're not saying that the current people who have screwed this whole thing up deserve more money, right? Well, actually, you, I, you're going to find you're going to find I have a very strange position on this, which is, in, in you know, my, my friend Peter Thiel and I talk about this all the time. Uh, his model is is that you know at some level when the economy isn't working, um, people engage in this kind of nonsensical uh, you know fratricide uh, of a, of a type. And my point is slightly different, uh, which is. This, this bad nature is always there, but it's like a, a compromised immune system. When, mm -hmm. the, the, when the economy starts to fail, 
you start to become aware of all of the pathogens in the world because it mm -hmm. can't fight them off. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very much the issue that if you're the guy with a compromised immune system, you're the only one aware of all the pathogens in the world. Um, and so at the moment, our collective economic immunity system is failing. Uh, and, and I actually am much more pessimistic than you are, Jordan. I, I see lots of reasons to be happy about the decrease in violence, but you know, one of the problems with the accounting in these theories is, is that the sword of Damocles that hangs over our heads, you know, is getting, is, has gotten quite large and the number of threads holding it up seem very few in number. And so you have to do the potential energy accounting as well as the realized violence and also understanding that the nature of in income inequality and um, differential access to financial markets and technology is creating a lot of very justifiable concern that the post-World War II stability is constantly in jeopardy. And if we mm -hmm. don't, I, I personally think we should think about a once every five years above ground nuclear test to remind ourselves <laughs> of what it is that we've pushed underground and we haven't seen for years because we are engaged in some kind of magical thinking that the world is fairly stable and that can turn on a dime. So what kind of out do you think we could, for this crew of journalists that we're talking about, that we want to be doing more journalism, we don't mm -hmm. want them to be attacked or any of those things, of course. What is the out? So the, I get it, you can give, you could fund them in a way that gives them a little more breathing room, but one of the things that I'm seeing when we're on tour is pe everyone that comes up to me after says, wow, you just gave us a little room to, yeah. to think. Yeah, yeah. So is there a way we, instead of beating these journalists, instead of getting the win where you crush them so that they're losers, what's the way that we can give them maybe a little well, room to well, get Well, I better? mean, it, it's, it's sort of standard behavioral practice in some sense is, this is something that was established by Skinner a long while back, even though he used threat and punishment as ways of altering the behavior of his experimental animals. He also used reward, but reward's a lot harder to use because <laughs> what you have to do is you have to watch very carefully, and then when you see an increment in the behavior that you want to, want to promote, you have to reward it, but it requires a tremendous amount of attention and subtle attention, and, and so one of the things that we can certainly do, and that I've been trying to do to some degree with my Twitter account is to, is to distribute good news, good credible news and good journalism when I see it, which mm -hmm. is partly why I started to get um, engaged, say, with Quillette, because I think they're doing a credible job. But one possibility is to distribute those pieces that seem to be increasingly reasonable and another is to also leap to the defense of people when they're taken out as individuals. And because one of the things that's happening now is that when an individual stands up and says something, especially that annoys the radical left, is that they tend to get mobbed and taken out. And that's a bad thing. It would be good if we could figure out ways of defending people against that. Yeah. I mean, Brett has been defended just... to some degree by the emergence of this group of people that, that Eric has been describing as the intellectual dark web. Yeah. And so there's some strength in numbers there that might be usefully applied. Can you just quickly talk about that, just on the personal level? Because I think one of the most moving things that I've heard on this show was when uh, I had you on, and I think, you, I think it was with Brett, and you said that standing with him was really one of the most validating things that you've ever done in your life. And it's such an example of what you've been talking about on the tour, that if you want to fix the world, then fix yourself a little bit. And then the more that you do that, you might start affecting things around you. And I think that that's, by, by helping your brother in this case, you, you were sort of helping the world. Well, um, yeah, uh, th that's nice. But I, I, uh, the returns to me um, were high and has nothing to do with follower counts on Twitter or anything like that. Of course, that. of course. Um, I, I don't think that you, you know, we should talk about positive models of masculinity. Mm -hmm. And um, standing shoulder to shoulder with somebody in a fight is an important part of what it means to be complete in a masculine sense. And I think that we are all incentivized by shows, you know, like Survivor or, you know, the, the Last Contestant or whatever, all this stuff. And, and, you know, they do the promos with the contestants on these shows, like, I'm not here to make friends, I'm mm -hmm. here to win, you know? <laughs> okay, well, what is that? That's mm -hmm. corporate America teaching us mm -hmm. uh, how to stab everyone else in the back on your way to the top. 
Well, which that's actually doesn't work very well, by the way. It doesn't work at all, mm -hmm. right? Or not if, for that if long, you can't, I guess. If you can't follow, you can't lead. Mm -hmm. And if uh, you can't make friends, well, if then you can't you're, make you're, friends, you're, you're alone and vulnerable. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, maybe Stalin if you're got chimp. to the, is the best example of a really malignant person who managed to kill everybody, including, I think, his wife. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very rare that anybody, you know, does that. Really what, what these things are, because you have to remember that fragging is a possibility. The, the lowest person yeah. in your organization uh, can take you down if they're not happy. Right, right. Right, and so I think that what people need to understand is, is that there is this lost art of standing with somebody that you don't 100% agree with, who says things that are like, you know, th there are definitely things you do on stage that I'm not comfortable with, but if somebody comes to attack you, uh, fundamentally, um, I know that all of those points I can bring up to you you know, face to face. I assume it's true in reverse. And so this idea of standing with people, you know, Dave, you've been going down a libertarian path that I'm uncomfortable with often, but somebody says, yeah. you know. And we hash it out publicly we, and privately. Publicly yeah. and privately. Yeah. And so, and, and, and there's stuff I'll do privately with you that I won't do publicly mm -hmm. because um, I think that it is important to learn how to stand in units because otherwise you just get picked off. And this is, mm -hmm. you know, there's a topic that I want to bring up a little bit later, which is what do I think the IDW, since you've discussed it, gets wrong? And one thing I think we get wrong is, is that the tribalism that we keep seeing is so toxic that we decide that we are anti-tribal. Mm -hmm. It's not the right model. You want to be adaptively tribal and adaptively individualistic, right? These things matter. Groups matter. Groups have specialized knowledge. Very often, you know, I my group, has certain stuff, your group has a different, we engage in trade. Um, it is important to understand that tribalism can be adaptive. And so it's very troubling to me that the, the dumbest voices on the other side are causing us to overreact too simplistically. So standing with my brother, yeah, there's a reason that you know people say he's like a brother to me, because it mm -hmm. means that you will put yourself at great risk. And I, you know, I've taken a lot of slings and arrows for, for, for Brett, and there's a pleasure in it. I'm not gonna say that it didn't lead to sleepless nights and that I don't worry about friends that I've lost, but it's also, you know, in some sense, good to know. And, and people respond positively because it's in our, it's in our makeup to, to say, well, that guy didn't run from a fight. So do we basically have to just mat model it out for people in our behavior? So for example, when the New York Times piece came out on you about three weeks ago, the enforced monogamy yeah. piece. Now the, the author of it, I, I'm not even gonna mention her name, but if you want it, you can go ahead. Um, she sat in the green room with us. I think on the first night in Toronto, she mm. was all smiles, oh, friendly. Yeah. You even said to me how much you like her and you mm -hmm. introduced me to her and yeah. we, were, you know, we were chatting. Um, she seemed perfectly pleasant and lovely. And then, of course, this piece comes out. It implies that you're for forced monogamy, which is, which, why don't you just explain that real quick? Just do, do a one-minute well, recap implication on, was, on what you were the, talking about. The implication about. was, and, and, and to the degree that this has been, let's say, exaggerated in the aftermath of the piece, the implication was that I was promoting the idea that you know, perfectly innocent women would be lined up by the state and distributed en masse to undeserving males so yeah. that they wouldn't be violent. We've only know. done that at one show, right? Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's, and it didn't, it didn't go that it well. It did not go so, well. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and, and th that was quite curious because that part of the conversation I had with the journalist lasted probably two minutes out of what was essentially a two-day interview. And it was obviously something that triggered her imagination um, in, in the sense that she saw that she could use it for, for, I don't know, for political purposes or something like that in the piece. But it was so palpably absurd because the, and I would say amateurish in some sense as well, because the position that she accused me of holding, A, uh, I didn't hold, so that, that's the first problem. B, no one holds. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're going to try to pillory someone, in a manner that's at least vaguely believable, you should accuse them of holding a view that at least some person <laughs> has held at some point. Right. And no one has ever held that view. And then the other thing that was quite um, off-putting, let's say, is that she's not stupid. She knew perfectly well what I meant by enforced monogamy, by the term. It's an anthropological term. It's been used for a uh, hundred years. And the idea that Polygamous societies, which would be the contrast, say, to monogamous societies, the idea that they're more violent is no one disputes that. Yeah. It's, it's like an a anthropological, sociological, and psychological truism, and it's also one that's been, it's not like the left has been promoting polygamy. 
you know, so so it was it was well the 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 the, the article uh, surprised me to say the least. Well, yeah, but, but you made a, an interesting move after that, which ties this all together, because you did a little checking on the phrase in in the archives of the New York Times. Well, the, the, the whole point t to me was uh, if I could take Jordan out of the equation and I could make it into the New York Times wrestling with itself. Uh, I was pretty sure that the New York Times would have some record of having used the phrase enforced monogamy at some point. And so I went to the search engine and I put in, quote, enforced monogamy, close quote. And sure enough, there were two relatively recent references within the last 20, 25 years, both of them positive. One, uh, I believe, coming out of evolutionary theory in Dr Drosophila, where it's a less common term in evolutionary theory, but it has leaked into the evolutionary literature, and the other one uh, coming from Af Afghanistan where um, you have polygamous marriage and that leaves too many violent young men with nothing to do mm -hmm. and that can be useful if you're conquesting other lands, saying, well, you have no wife here, but there's, a, there's territory over there. And this is exactly, you know, the New York Times was celebrating the idea that in a culture that was at that, that stage in its evolution, uh, enforced monogamy was something that uh, went hand in hand with women's rights because, of course, right. having which uh, is the classic fewer, argument, having fewer violent men with no romantic prospects is in mm -hmm. general good for the safety of women. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing, which is, is actually my point, well, I know, yeah. I know. But the, but the point was, can I take Jordan out of it and say the New York Times is wrestling with itself and mm -hmm. not fairly? And this mm -hmm. is the great danger: is that that finger is on the scale. Now the other thing mm -hmm. is, is that. That particular journalist first met, uh, was talking with Brett um, well before talking with you, and then Brett sent this journalist to me. And by the way, I don't think that we should not talk about the name of the journalist, since the journalist is certainly using your name. And the idea, sure. so it's mm -hmm. Nellie Bowles, and right, right. Uh, I found her engaging, mm -hmm. uh, charming, mm -hmm. uh, very quick, intelligent. Mm -hmm. The thing that I didn't appreciate, and I got fairly far into my discussion with her, and I was off the record, is, you know, she began with the gambit, well, of course, I'm going to be running your tweet on James Damore, which, um, you know, went viral and uh, was widely misinterpreted, and again, in a deliberate fashion, which uh, my tweet was responding to somebody saying, you know, if human re resources, somebody else from Google tweeted, if human resources won't do something about this, then, you know, they're going to have trouble on their hands. And I was like, okay, you're telling people to run to human resources because James Damore uh, is looking at big five uh, psychometrics for personality and asking the question, how do we increase the uh, accessibility uh, of Google to female coders? And whether you agree with this technique or not, uh, I think that that was clearly his point. So the, the idea is I'm going to bring up this tweet that has been widely uh, mischaracterized of yours, Eric. And you know what became clear was she had the idea that she wanted to find the men's rights activist community. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, she said something about, well, you're MRA. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't even know what that meant. So I mm -hmm. said, NRA? Like, <laughs> I, I thought it was National Rifle <laughs> right, Association. Right, right, right. And she's like, you know, men's rights activist. I said, what? And so we had this. Well, that was just you being disingenuous, because of course you know what men's rights activists are. Right, well, yeah, I, I you are one. Yeah, OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the point would be, you know, it's like, you, you believe in human rights, yes. Well, you know, men are human, so you believe in men's rights. And you believe that one should be active, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, at some level, it's a reserved term for people who are very often kind of veering a spectrum of people who are talking about bad aspects of family, you know, law versus people who are downright misogynist. Right, 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 right. And I was just aghast, which is like, why are you trying to shoehorn me into this pre-existing mm -hmm. thing. In well, which, that's the question. It's, well, this it's is, the motivation for the for the shoehorning. And well, this is so. Well, this is the big issue coming. You know, it's hard well, to track all the threads. Let me let me yeah, just get yeah. back to it. What we don't understand is is that they've invested in all of this cognitive Lego, right? So they've you know, the equity or toxic yes. masculinity yes. or white so, privilege, whatever these things are, mm -hmm. and so everything in high dimensional space gets shoved into mm -hmm. this completely inappropriate kind of cognitive yes, Lego. Absolutely. Which the, furthermore, the format of these things, like I recently got asked to, to do a bit on a, on a show on television on an established network, and they said, you know, we're really blowing it out. We've, we've, t we've got the message that this new form of uh, long form interview 
uh, is the is wave of the future. It's like, well, how much am I going to get? Yeah. We might go from five to eight minutes. Right. Right. And so <laughs> right, right, right. the idea is like, you I can't say well, hello in five well, minutes. Well, but this is the point, right? It's like, I have access to three hours when I want it. Right. They're like, well, that's insane. Right. It's like, they can't move that much. No. And so for no, well, a long that's partly why the format's dying. Because, and, and it's also, I think, one of the reasons that we think we're stupider than we are. I like this point our, a lot. Our, our, including our audience, is that, you know, because TV, one of the things I have noticed about television in general is that it's predicated on the presumption that the audience is stupid. But if you have to force everything through a channel whose maximum dimension is six minutes, right. then everyone's going to look well, stupid. Well, this is the thing. This is, if you think about what happened where television went from being the dumb medium to the incredibly smart medium when you went from TV dramas of a half an hour, yeah. or maybe an hour in length, to many, many shows over a season exactly. developing characters at a level that a film can't touch. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and that literature approaches. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So the idea is that in The Sopranos or Mad Men or Game of Thrones, people are following incredibly difficult and rich plots. And you, you have to go back to this old adage, which nobody ever lost a dime uh, underestimating the intelligence of the American people. Mm -hmm. Well, that's only true if you don't yeah. understand opportunity cost, because people have been not losing dimes, but millions, by not understanding that anyone mm -hmm. who can follow Game of Thrones, right? How mm -hmm. is it that this thing that we're about to do, I have no idea why, you know, we're just having a conversation. There's gonna be over 100,000 views of this mm -hmm. thing, I think, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. I, I got of one course. video on my channel of any substance, uh, one video, it's got nearly 60,000 views. People are hungry for this thing that they're being starved yep, for. Yes, and definitely. what they don't understand in the regular media mm -hmm. is, is that their format is killing them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, Well, it, and this it, is something we really, we really have to pay attention to because a tremendous amount of what's going on is the consequence. You know, you said that a, a complex reality is being shoveled into a, 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 a tiny dimensional space, and so there's some ideological reasons for that. But I think some of that is being fed by the channels of the media because it's a lot easier to take a complex situation like that and shovel it into a pre-existing a priori interpretive space because everyone already understands it. Mm -hmm. So if you've only got a few minutes, then there's a bunch of things that you don't have to explain because you're just telling the well, same old worse story. Than that, because what, what, what we also don't grasp is that we don't file flight plans. Like you're mm -hmm. having me on the show, you don't know what what I'm going to say. You don't know what my positions are on immigration. You don't know what my positions are on abortion. We've never gotten to that, I don't think. And I was actually thinking that about both of you. I don't think we've ever discussed it. We, we can get into we, it. We but can. Yeah. Yeah. But what, the, the way the, the, this commentariat works, and I've been waking up to the idea that this layer even exists because I didn't think about it too much, is that mostly these people have consistent takes. That is, they mm -hmm. are counted upon to take mm -hmm. complicated reality and you know, give us the Tom Friedman point. Mm -hmm. Give us the give us the Paul Krugman point. You know, give us the Ezra Klein view. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, well, why is there a sort of regular, consistent view on these things? Like I've watched Jordan. I've watched you change your mind in real time as somebody makes a good argument, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit painful because somebody was listening to you, and then they say, well, how do I have faith in your argument? And my answer is, how do you have faith in any of this stuff? All of this stuff can reverse. Won't you have more faith if somebody can reverse themselves? You know, I'm thinking well, about this well, thing about the, the, the baking a cake for a gay couple. Yes, yes. Well, look what happened. Good, and we'll get back to Nellie Bowles because I, w I want to return to that. But, you know, one of the things that was really interesting to watch in Vancouver, I just had two discussions with Sam Harris, and the, the discussion was set up from a promotional perspective by a promoter. Um, who was doing his job as a kind of a combat situation, right? There was going to be a victory. It would be Sam or me in, in the final analysis. But versus, it actually. Mm -hmm. it versus, yeah, right, versus, right, yeah. right. And so, but what happened was that Sam and I actually had a discussion where we were trying to lay out our points to understand each other's points. And we set this up. It was one of Brett's ideas, actually, because Brett, your, your brother, mo uh, moderated. When the second discussion opened, what he had us do was summarize each other's arguments. So I put forth Sam's arguments in the strongest possible terms, the steel and he did the same. And yeah. that, worked, that worked just fine, by the way. But what was so interesting was the audience would have um, settled for a debate that culminated in the victory of one of us over the other. But instead, what happened was they got engaged in a discussion that we had both designed 
to push both of our capabilities of thinking farther along. And so, and we weren't sure if that would work because we weren't sure if we could talk, but it turned out that we could, and partly thanks to Brett's help. And then the original format was we were going to talk for an hour for the first one, and then we were going to open it up to Q&A. But the discussion got very intense, and I would have, I likened it to an approximate level of a pretty good PhD defense. You know, if, if, you're, if you have a good student who's, who's defending, and you know they know the literature, you can really go after them because it gives them a chance to show their mastery, right? So right. it can be a real positive thing for them. And so it was like a dual PhD defense, D-U-A-L and D-U-E-L at the <laughs> same time. But the audience was right there with us. Right. And then at the end of the hour, Brett asked them, should we switch to the Q&A or should we continue the discussion? Because we're in the middle of something. And overwhelmingly, the yep. sentiment was, continue the discussion. And so we did model the process of... I wouldn't say respectful dialogue because first of all that's a cliche and second of all that wasn't what this was. What we were doing was actually engaging in the process of trying to make both of us smarter than we were. And and people are are in for that. They're 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 on board for that. Mm -hmm. And they would they would prefer that to the cheap victory by yeah. all appearances. So what do you think that says then if that the audience that was there and from what I can see with our audiences that they care more about Un unlocking some truths than they do about the victory. Mm -hmm. When we live in a time where everyone wants to dunk on everybody constantly, well, I keep seeing the phrase pop up. People where you get you, I dunked on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's nobody wants it. But they keep mm -hmm. shoveling. No, it's not it that nobody us. wants it. I mean, well, it's better than being bored, and it's better than stasis, and it's better than capitulation. That's right. But it's not as good as what could be if you got what was optimal. Well, and I see this with my own videos. People keep chopping them up and say, you know, Peterson demolishes, ex, ex, you know, and obviously that's clickbait. Mm -hmm. But that was also one of the things that made me think about the degeneracy, degeneration of journalism per se into clickbait. I mean, that's emerging spontaneously on YouTube as a method for attracting attention. Yeah. And these people, as they get more desperate, as their, as their modality dies, then it's not surprising that they, that they, they turn to... They're oversimplifications for the reasons well, you outlined, but also to attract attention. Yeah. Is, is, wait, real quick. Is it possible that it worked for a while, that that sort of exposure and, and clickbait nonsense made sense mm -hmm. sort of at the beginning of the internet? Because we were all so stuck in the, uh, in the old structures that we needed something to really wake us up. But now we're sort of past that. You don't no. think so? That You don't think we're past it enough that it doesn't no, work look, anymore? If you want to... Uh, avoid having me as a guest in the future. Here's one of the standard moves that I make. Stop talking about what's good and bad and start putting the phrase adaptive and maladaptive in front of different modalities. We like adaptive dunk dunking. I I've got this problem with this guy Noah Smith. I don't know what is his problem is. He he's an economist. He's engaging. He's uh, relatively charming. He has got a position on immigration where he just loves immigration. There's nothing, you can't have too much immigration. Immigration mm -hmm. is just the best thing in the world. Maybe it has some problems in some sector, but in general, uh, it's a free lunch. And I've done work on this to try to show, no, it's a much more complicated situation. And behind the scenes, it's being abused as, has nothing to do with immigrants. It's Americans transferring wealth into their own pockets from other Americans using immigrants. We can get into this later. I've tried. I've had lunch with the guy. I've shown him my papers, my research. He absolutely does not want a discussion. What, what does he want? Well, he wants to have, uh, have his advance point? an idea that immigration is a pure good mm -hmm. and that um, you know, the National Academy of Sciences has found that it, we, we get this benefit from it. And it has to do with, one, rights, which don't show up in, in, a, in a max demand in an economics framework. It has to do with something uh, involving the securitization of rights so that people don't have their rights taken uh, as if by eminent domain. Um, he knows all this stuff, and he just chooses to continue down this path. And uh, Sam has, has seen this with well, Reza, that, that, with, 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 mm -hmm. with Reza Aslan um, and with Glenn Greenwald, who in some ways... I always thought of as pretty positive, and then I, you know, he gets he gets a bug uh, in, in his head, and you get these incredibly negative uh, people who don't want to come into a discussion. Mm -hmm. And it's important to reserve the dunking on modality mm -hmm. for when people are really not acting as good actors. You know. Yeah. And well, that's kind of what I did with. I decided to take a lawsuit out against Wilfrid Laurier University so that would be, two weeks ago, and that was. And, I'm, you know, I've been trying to reserve my Twitter defense 
let's say, or attack, because it, it's not always easy to distinguish between those. Like, I, I, I've learned to leave people alone when they make untoward comments, mm -hmm. unless they are journalists of some repute right. or professors of some repute, in right. which case I think I have a moral obligation not to remain silent. Right. And so it's not so easy to figure out when you should defend yourself and when you should shut up. Well, first never of all, is the wrong time to defend yourself. I would prefer yourself. that we don't defend ourselves because it's as, you always have this problem of special pleading. Are you defending yourself because you believe in the ideas or are you defending yourself because it's a possible threat to your own reputation? Right, right. right? Mm -hmm. That's a big problem. And so problem. that's one of the reasons I came to your assistance on the enforced monogamy thing because I didn't want you having to make that point and if at some point in the future I get into trouble and you think that I have merit my position, perhaps you'll return the favor and we can figure out the game theory later. But that's, that's what culture actually does. But doesn't that also just feed the beast in a certain way? So if you defend, a, you know, a professor goes after you who has you know, no notoriety but just wants to get in on the game. Yeah. Right. Well, now you've defended yourself. Now, next thing you know, Vox or BuzzFeed is writing about the professor but, but, nobody knows yeah. and but Jordan let's, Peterson. Yeah, but yeah, let's, yeah. Well, that's a danger for but, sure. But, look. I am also, I am not a huge fan of the dunk on mentality as a opening gambit. I am slow mm -hmm. to anger in these situations. I tend to give people three benefits of the doubt yes, before I start. Yes, which is what, what you should do, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, for example, I had Ezra Klein and his wife over for a Shabbat dinner with Gad Said, um, you know, after the Sam Harris thing, and I wanted to understand Ezra's position. And Ezra had, in fact, Vox had done a, a piece where I talked about the need to blend hyper-capitalism with hyper-socialism in the future, because I think, anthrop I think about this thing of anthropic capitalism, the capitalism that worked in the 19th and 20th centuries may have been an accident for where the parameters were set on, uh, in our market so that it could function as well as it did. Hmm. And, you know, Ezra, um, I don't want to get into all the personal details of the interaction, but it was fascinating talking to Ezra and his wife as to how they see the world and getting a behind-the-scenes look at what generates Vox. So I think it's very important to try to be charitable in understanding other people and understanding their motivations, but there is a point when you've hit something three, four, five times, the person's evidence comp comprehension and then they go into this mode. Like you talked about this with Kathy Newman where mm -hmm. you had one kind of interaction with her before and then suddenly somebody, three, two, one, go. And it's like, so what you're really saying is, yeah. well, where did that personality come out of? Mm -hmm. And that has to do in part with you know, the masks that we all put on. I think that one of the things is, I know you guys both personally, um, this mirrors this is it. how we talk you know, in a different context, yeah. um, but when you know when when Vox's the weeds discussed the intellectual dark web, I thought it was incredibly confused. Mm -hmm. Very interestingly, after the Barry Weiss article, almost no one from the standard media called me up to clarify to sort of <laughs> learn more because Barry was the owner of this thing, and so it was assumed that Barry had named it that this was Barry's mm -hmm. beat. And so Barry was the go-to person, as if we were all owned by the particular member of the commentariat who decided to actually blow this up and make it large. We have to become more charitable. I, I do think that in part, part of the problem that we've been having with the, the sort of madness and the progressives is that first of all, unlike the Charlottesville right, the progressives are in the establishment, whereas the tiki torch holders right. are like, off in their mother's garage, mm -hmm. and that's a big, big difference. And so, one of the reasons we're animated is, is, is that, you know, you remember that line, it's coming from inside the house? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. it's yeah, coming exactly. from inside yes, the house. Definitely. Yeah. On the other hand, I do see a lot of points that these people have that they're just terribly misinstantiated. The problem of the progressives, in my, in my estimation, I, you know, might have, my family has been progressive since the 20s. Um, is that they're terrible at what they do. They're just not good progressive. It's like hmm. a really malignant, well, bad it's form. Some, well, let let some, me give an example. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> English is odd in that it is inflected for gender only in the third person singular. Now, Turkish, for example, is not inflected for gender. There's one pronoun, o, oh, for he, she, it. So you don't have this problem in Turkish um, when you are referring to, to a character in a story who's not present. Um, we had this problem for, uh, in English, for inflected, inflection for marital status, which was true for females and not males. Mr. was Mr., but Miss and Mrs. gave you more information. So there was a one-time backwards incompatible change that got made with Ms., 
And it, you know, it still rankles because it doesn't sound great, but I think it was a good idea uh, to, make, to give women um, the equality that they deserved and shouldn't have to ask for. Okay, if you wanted to actually do the pronoun thing for English, would you start with trans or would you start with intersex? Now, if you started with intersex, everyone is intellectually sympathetic with intersex. There are people whose gender or whose sex is ambiguous, right? Because of the way in which development sort of takes female and turns it into male if the SRY protein is present. So this Everyone who understands this, just to be clear, not everyone who hears about this, but everyone who has... In general, yeah. no matter how conservative somebody is, if I tell them there's a person born with ambiguous genitalia um, or you know they've got an SRY protein uh, on an X chromosome or they have a malfunctioning one on a Y so that they appear to be the opposite phenotype for their genotype, there's compassion. This person was born, a soul was born without the expected assignment. And there's no question about development and should we be steering, you should be more male, you should be more masculine, more feminine in order to avoid like the sky high um, suicidal uh, temptations for people who feel that they are one thing while evidencing that they are something else in the physical. Okay, you would make the change based on intersex. You'd make a one-time backwards incompatible change to the language with a, a, pro a pronoun like Turkish has. And then trans would have what it wanted without this craziness of everybody gets to design their own personal pronoun, which is a disaster. Like in a computer science course, you would never allow people, you, you'd give them a choice so that the coding can go through. Everybody can't have their own pronoun, mm -hmm. right? And so that's how you do it. And if you wanted it to win, that's how you, 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 you'd push it through. Now, what they want is something else. They want to say something like, trans women are no less women than women who are born biologically female. Well, that's not true, right? I understand it, it is the case that every single culture, every traditional culture of which I'm aware, there is gender ambiguity. In South Sulawesi, you have a priestly class from it. In India, you have the hijras. Um, you know, Turkey's national uh, treasure, uh, Zeki Muren, uh, was more feminine than Liberace. Uh, mm -hmm. I just came from Italy, where the, in the Uffizi Gallery, there's an entire room called the Hermaphrodite Room, uh, dedicated to a beautiful statue uh, of an ostensibly female um, recumbent uh, model with a male genitalia. There, there is, you know, the Shah, not the Shah of Iran, the Ayatollah in Iran, um, came out with a, a proclamation that it was okay to have gender reassignment surgery. So we, it's not like traditional cultures don't know about this. It's not like we haven't made accommodation. It's always been an issue, whether it's the Katuis in, in Thailand, um, which are among the best spoken and most educated people that you meet as a traveler. The issue is that we somehow wanted to make a wedge issue out of this. Mm -hmm. I am going to force you to say things that aren't true as an evidence of my power as opposed to... Well, that's why exactly why I opposed the legislation in Canada to begin with, because part and parcel, what came along with that as part and parcel of it, and this was no accident, was a legal insistence that uh, gender differences were socio-culturally socio constructed. It's like, well, they're not. And I thought, well, what the hell? Why are we enshrining that viewpoint into law? I mean, that's not to say that gender doesn't vary, gender expression doesn't vary substantially because of socio-cultural conditions, because you have to be a fool not to see that that's the case. But that's another situation where the, the multi-dimensional complexity seems to exceed the processing capacity of the ideologues, is that there's more than one factor well, at they, work. No, no, they, they know what they're doing. Like, for example, should a skirt be seen as feminine or masculine. Well, we know from India where the lungi is, is popular, for Scotland where there's a kilt, that this is a variable. In other words, you shouldn't hard code skirts are for girls, mm -hmm. right? And so the idea is that there's a huge developmental aspect to learning, here are the assignments in your culture. Now, at some point, you want to steer people into, we have a huge interest in the breeding family is the core of lineage in a society. And we need to care both about gays, about um, 
people of uh, uncertain gender, non-binary people, et cetera. But we can't lose sight of the fact that we also have to care about the, fam the breeding family in distress. And now, we also have to provide people with an easy pathway to a reasonably stable identity, well, to not the, confuse them to but death. This is the point, is that they have an argument that I think we are learning that gender un discomfort is far more common than we ever thought, although far less prevalent than the discussion uh, seems to suggest. You do have a societal interest in steering people to roles if it's possible. But once somebody is like committedly non-binary, a switch has to flip on us. And we have to become compassionate and recognize that we have a soul that we have to take care of. And we do have to make some allowances. If you, if you know anybody who's intersex, for example, you know that it's a terrifying state that they face violence. I mean, you know, why don't you see dudes kissing? I always claim that it's the implied threat of violence where if it makes people uncomfortable, um, you don't see people holding hands quite so comfortably, and you don't see people being themselves. So if we, for example, in the IDW, stood up for intersex and say, this is the right way to do what you're doing, I think it would be an absolute service to the world because that's something we could push through. I don't think that the, con that the conservative uh, you know, Christians in this country um, are going to have a die hard, they're gonna feel like, well, if the Lord made people in that way, we have to accept uh, all the products of God's creation. Where do you fall on that? Because this is where people will say, well, Jordan's against trans people and gay people. I mean, all the, all the nonsense yeah, well, that the, I hear the, about the, you The situation in Canada was quite clear, is that the, the federal government, following the provincial governments, decided that it was okay to impose requirements for the regulation of speech. And I didn't care what the reason for that was. I thought that it was a terrible legislative move. And partly not because it wasn't only compelled speech. I read the policy guidelines that were the framework within which this bill was to be interpreted. There's pages and pages of them, all on the Ontario Human Rights Commission website, which was linked to the federal website um, where they had announced how this bill would be interpreted. And it contained all sorts of terrible things, like the insistence that gender was, was a social, sociocultural construct. And it's in part a sociocultural That's construct. Great. And these things are, this, you cannot do that. Because all of a sudden, the legislation see, seemed to imply that a discussion about the biological differences between men and women might be regarded as hate speech. And I also think we're a fair ways along that pathway in Canada. So I don't think that my fears about the bill were unwarranted. And I think that what happened at Wilfrid Laurier University is an absolutely perfect example of that. So I think that my stance on that piece of legislation was substantively correct. Now, the problem is, is that, or, or the, the treachery that was involved in the bill, because I see the bill as an attempt by the radical left to gain linguistic dominance over, yes. increasing linguistic dominance over the conversation as a whole, using trans people as the sacrificial right. victims. And by the way, I got no shortage of letters from trans people saying, I'm not so happy being used as a sacrificial victim for the left to advance its linguistic hegemony. Mm -hmm. I got a lot more letters like that from trans people than I did from trans people criticizing what I did. Mm -hmm. So, and I also think that this would have died away very rapidly if all it was about was one professor's objection to the rights of trans people. That had very little to Jordan, do with it. Let, let, let's just take this, in, take this bull by the horns right now. Am I correct, and I, you and I have not discussed this, that your point would be that law is the wrong place to do it and that culture would be the right place yes, to do absolutely. it? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and this so has then, to be bottom up like the Miz thing was. I understand that. Hmm. So my point is... Law is absolutely the wrong so place to do this. So then why not let this? it come from us? I mean, in other words, this thing has been so crazily interpreted by the press. This is, this is absolute malpractice as far as I'm concerned by our journal. Mm -hmm. This is journogenic... Um, Malpractice. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I should I should speak up for some of the journalists in Canada because the the Post Media Group, there's 200 newspapers, Sorry. came out in support of my stance. So I there are journalists that, who but, aren't doing but that. But my point is is that the fact that we're still having to discuss this is a tax on all kinds of discussion. Mm -hmm. That I, the more time I have to spend saying I'm not alt right, uh, you know, transphobic. I don't want to talk racist. about the fact that I'm in an interracial ma marriage uh, because I, I oppose these. You know, equ equity proposals mm -hmm. that are complete abominations. Right, right. right. It, remember when you and I were in Tempe, Arizona, at the, at the comedy club, and I said something like, "You know, 
we shouldn't be celebrating this. I'm in an inter interracial marriage. And everybody like, yeah, like yeah, Green yeah, Seals yeah, is yeah, clapping. Yeah, I said, yeah. stop it. Yeah, I said, yeah. Unless a few of you are admissions officers to Ivy League schools, in which case I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, I know is, it's a terrible thing to take applaud. credit for that. Yeah. Right, it's yeah. like you happen to fall in love with a person of color. Is, is, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not is, a moral victory is there a on your medal, part. Is there a medal, you know, in your future? You don't want it. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm trying to say is something slightly different, which is I want in on the positive aspects of the social transformation. I know that the, my intersex people are hurting, and I know that trans people um, are present in every culture without the social justice stuff. And we should be spearheading what the incompetent progressive left can't get done. Well, so is that things, is that what we're doing? Well, it's one I mean, of the things that well, I want to be doing. Like yeah. you know, gay marriage turned on a dime over a very short period of time. Like smoking, right? Somehow that there's no smoking in bars. It's almost incredible, you know, if you're old enough to think about mm -hmm. that. We should be spearheading this thing because they can't get the job done. Okay, and what so is our point? Not in law. Yeah, not in law. But do it in culture. You can't have everybody do his or her own pronouns, which is an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. But we could settle on, you know, and you could do hey, hey and they, you know, pronouns or something like this. I don't know what the right thing. Get a linguist uh, to figure out the, the minimally intrusive, one-time backwards incompatible change to the language. It, it's going to be painful. Uh, I'm not looking forward to it, but we could get it done. So one of the things that I've been doing in my public lectures is talking about the appropriate and responsible position of the left. So, you know, on, it seems to me that if you're pursuing goals that have value, which you have to do, because you have to do things in order to stay alive, you have to pursue goals of value. If you do that in a social, social space, which you're compelled to do, then you're going to produce hierarchies because people differ in competence. And you actually want to produce hierarchies that are based on competence because they're efficient tools for getting that particular job done. And so it's a reasonable position for people on the, in the center and on the right to say, stand behind the hierarchies. But by the same token, hierarchies can tilt towards uh, corruption and tyranny, and they tend to dispossess people because talents are distributed unequally. Right. So the left, the position of the left, that's the appropriate position, is to speak up for the dispossessed to keep the hierarchies flexible enough so that they don't turn into tyranny. And so then you have a dialogue between the right and the left that's necessary to maintain the hierarchy, but also to prune it and keep it healthy. And so one of the things that we could conceivably contribute to is to improve the health, as you're pointing out, conceptually and otherwise, of the dialogue on the left. It's like to give the devil yeah, his due, so to speak, and, and to say that, of course, there's a, a place for the left. The question is, when do they go too far, which is what I've been trying to push the moderates on. Jordan, think about this. This is beyond communism. If you think about one phrase that sums up the theory of communism, what would you, what would you say? What the most famous phrase? Well, probably from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Now look at the first part of that phrase. From each according to their ability. Right. So the mm -hmm. idea is that there are different abilities acknowledged in the very right. core of communism. <laughs> this right. is beyond that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Right. Well, I actually already think, that. Well, yeah. I, I think the most pathological, the deepest unidimensional pathology that characterizes the radical left is actually an attack on competence itself. And so when I was at the Aspen Ideas Festival a couple of days ago, I made the case that um, our hierarchies in the West are determined at least in part by competence. Right Now, the degree to which it's pure competence can be disputed, but intelligence and conscientiousness are the best predictors of long-term life success, even though they don't predict more than about 25% of the variance. But the buzz surrounding what I said was that Jordan Peterson um, is validating the current patriarchy by making the radical claim that it's predicated on competence. It's like, well, why would they twist that argument? Because it isn't what I said. I said that their competence is a partial contributor to our successful hierarchies. And I think the reason is, is that the, the very idea of differential competence is unacceptable to the most radical well, proponents hang on for of the a left. Second. Let's look at two separate systems, because I think that what people do is they focus on one rather than the other, and, and I've had to learn how to do this. If we look at chess, which can be made blind, where you don't know who you're playing uh, across the internet, and we look at musical editions for classical orchestras, uh, where you can put people behind a screen, uh, and I think this became popular in the 80s, 90s, a particular bassist who is also a psychologist may have been instrumental in, in getting this change. 
When you introduced the screen, women's participation in orchestras went up. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Right, so it was a very positive social program because competency was apparently being suppressed uh, by people's by perception by prejudice. Mm -hmm. It was a structural problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it didn't go as far as people wanted. Maybe it didn't get to fifty-fifty. I don't know what the stats are. I can look mm -hmm. in on that. Mm -hmm. When you do it in chess, I don't believe it has a positive effect. When they it, did it in the Australian civil service for blind CVs, it had the opposite effect. Women got underselected. Right. So, well, so, so you're saying even well, the but language. You're, but but my, you're saying is that this is situationally situation well, specific. The point is, is that the people who want to talk about chess, where of the hundred, top hundred players, last I checked, it was ninety-nine to one, male to female, which is so like even with structural bigotry. Man, that's hard to explain. Right, right, right. Uh, in the other case of the classical orchestras, I, I, what was it? Twenty percent increased participation of females. That's a giant amount, mm -hmm. and they're both true. Mm -hmm. And right. so the problem is when you push everything and you shove it into the low dimensional space, you have this idea of um, is this structural uh, misrepresentation or is it something else? Well, it's both. And it's situationally dependent. My wife had to make a, a point to me, which I was blind to, because in physics, almost nothing matters other than like horsepower and creativity. You don't care mm. whether somebody's red, green, blue, male, female. Mm. It's just like almost nobody's got interesting ideas. It's so hard to make any progress whatsoever. You just want to take the far right tail of the distribution. You don't want to be harassed about anything other than that. Right, right. Okay. Math is like that. Too. Math, math, math is potentially even more. more yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife had to say to me, you know, Eric, not everything looks like theoretical physics or differential geometry. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you think about community policing, it can be extremely important to have diversity. Uh, because why do you want one ethnic group policing another ethnic group, or all cops being male? You want diversity in order to have good relations uh, so that people see themselves reflected on the force. And if there is bigotry and prejudice, it manifests itself. Uh, it, it's harder to manifest if people are, in fact, diverse. So that was a bit of a wake-up call. The other thing came from the Harvard Math Department, where it, for a period of time it appeared that they would let in one woman a year into the PhD program, and then she would have a terrible year and she'd drop out. Mm -hmm. And then one year a woman deferred her admission, and so they added another woman, and you had two women in the first year, and the two of them reinforced each other's reality. Like, you know, I think I just said something and everybody ignored it, or I mm -hmm. made a point mm -hmm. and then somebody mm -hmm. else uh, went to the chalkboard and wrote it down as if it was his idea. And this group of two women stayed in the program, and that meant that the next year there was one woman let in, okay, now there's a group of three, and that was an, a, a situation in which there was an organic change mm -hmm. in the apparent ability of women. Now, we need to be differentiating. We can't keep reacting to well, the madness of the left. Well, that's analysis. Right, mm -hmm. right, we can't, we have to be the ones who are saying, look, let me steal man your point. You're making a terrible version of this argument. I think I can even do better, and you're welcome. <laughs> right? Because well, the other thing it's doing is it's deranging our conversation. This is why I had you talk to Ben and ask him point blank about whether he would use the pronouns. And his point was, I, I will in general be happy to use somebody's preferred program, except if we're discussing uh, Trans issues, which in which case it is to cede the argument that right, there is no right, right. He doesn't want to publicly cede right. the argument, right. but and privately. He's he that's the linguistic. That's the linguistic ground. He's yeah. open yeah. about it, and yeah. this is what we have to stop reacting to the mat to, to the crazy making substrate. So basically, you think that for the people that are keeping the, their foot on the pedal at, at the highest possible level, we sort of just have to let that go. But do you think it would be enough? So if, let's say tomorrow you start, we finish this show today and you say, all right, I'm gonna start being the champion for all the, the compassion that trans people, I mean, I know you're compassionate to all people, but I'm gonna be publicly more compassionate to trans people and intersex people and, all of, and address all of the issues that you just brought up. If there's another set of people that are never gonna throw you a bone on that, that are mm -hmm. never gonna give you a little outreach on that, does it actually do anything, or you think it just allows us to get the refugees that'll kind of wake up around it? Well, I think that we're being drained of our empathy. I mean, let me let me say I am being drained of my empathy. Um, you know, there was a 
there was a tweet that the Kentucky Planned Parenthood put out where it was one of these. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, it was uh, some some men have uh, have a uterus, and they, they repeated it like eleven yes, times. Yes, yeah, yes. that's the big thing. Yeah. And if they'd written some trans men have a uterus, or if they'd written something, but we have to be compassionate that people who identify as, you know, whatever, I would be okay. But the idea of some men have you, well, there's actually something called persistent Mullerian duct syndrome, where people who are phenotypically male at birth appear to have a uterus because of the mysteries of development. I mean, again, the fact that males and females are one protein away from each other, mm -hmm. um, and, and treating each other like we're separate tribes as opposed to, um, you know, Fisher-like compliments, mm -hmm is absolutely insane. And so I find myself making fun of these people, and I, I had some tweet about, you know, either we're talking about persistent Mullerian duct syndrome or you're just eating crayons hoping <laughs> pooping a rainbow. And, you know, I thought about this. And I thought, I'm so unsympathetic with your trying to smuggle ideology into my world. Into yeah, we're using compassion. Into the laboratory. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this is... It's reprehensible well, I to smuggle get, in ideology under the guise of But, you know, this gets back to this issue that we have been having this expert conversation in the literature where all sorts of things that cause people to clutch pearls on their fainting couches are absolutely parts of the, you know, parts of the literature in biology and psychology and anthropology, all of these places. And now everything is discussed everywhere. So when you hear, you know, that there are group differences... Um, it's shocking if you haven't been part of the professional civil conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a big problem, is, is that this is this esoteric versus exoteric speak, which is the, the sort of intellectual um, elite in the universities have this private way of talking amongst themselves in journals, and then this public way of talking. And this is absolutely um, essential in some areas, but it's being abused in others. So, for mm -hmm. example, the trade theorists... Um, know that what they talk about, about the importance of free trade based on Ricardian equivalence and comparative advantage, uh, is a bullshit argument. Um, it, it's a very crude thing that's very hard to argue with mathematically. But if, behind the scenes, they're having a completely different conversation. And they have the idea of, we're entitled to do this. And the answer, in, from my perspective, is you just replaced one concept, which was uh, Caldor Hicks' uh, improvement with uh, with Pareto improvement. Pareto improvement makes everybody better off. Caldor Hicks leaves some people worse off and some people better off, and you'd have to tax the better off to compensate for the worse off. Well, we're, we're having a countrywide freakout because the economists have developed two separate conversations, one for the public, where they push out things that are not necessarily good for the median individual, or very bad for particular communities. and a separate conversation that they're having amongst themselves, and they're serving these interests. Well, we have to do something about this. We can no longer, this goes back to your Gutenberg point and the technology issue, we cannot have this level of division between the private and the public conversation. I, I know more about what's wrong with the immigration uh, in the high-tech sector than the National Academy feels, uh, National Academy of Sciences wants to discuss. They are at the center, effectively, of a conspiracy uh, in the 1980s and early 90s to change the laws of the United States in order to make it impossible for young scientists to bargain uh, with PhDs in hand with their employers to get the six-figure salaries that the market was going to give them. Now, we can, we can play a game where the National Academy is having a private conversation with me, where they've had me four or five times over there, and they're not going to have any reflection of this in the public. But I now have, you know, 100,000 Twitter followers. And I know why people are angry about immigration. It has nothing to do with immigrants. It has to do with transfer. It has to do with the fact that our ruling classes have been figuring out how to transfer money from one group of Americans to another group of Americans. And if they could use puppies, they'd use puppies, because you can't object to puppies. OK, well, the problem is, is, is that you now have a group of people who are able to have these conversations to say, let me show you the playbook. Let me show you what's really going on, on in these technical discussions. There, it, there are differences between groups that are measurable. IQ, I don't think any of us really want to be talking about race and IQ particularly. But when you try to say there is absolutely no evidence to show, well, that's not going to be true. And the scientists are going to have to say, look, I don't, 
I don't write reality. I report on what the literature says. Let me tell you what the literature says. And the literature says some things that we don't want it to say. But that's, that's, there's nothing new about that. Lots of science is very upsetting. Evolutionary theory is upsetting. Psychology is upsetting. And this upsetting literature, we haven't figured out what we are going to do culturally as it becomes available to everybody. And we have people who are sort of gleefully talking about things like race and IQ. And I want to tell them, cut it out. This, you know, we don't really know everything, but we're getting more and more knowledge, and I'm worried about where it can go. And we have other groups of people who say, you know, there's absolutely nothing to this race and IQ thing. And I'm just thinking, oh, well, this is like asbestos. You're, you're, you're now making an attempt to stir up the asbestos to try to get rid of it, and you're going to loosen all these fibers rather than doing this professionally and scientifically the right way. So I do think that there's an issue about the esoteric, the exoteric, and what it is that we are going to do as experts to handle the knowledge that we've been sort of exposed to and that the public hasn't. And it's coming out in the worst ways, and this is part of what's fueling the whole Make America Great Again situation, which is the public knows something is off with their expert communities. The expert communities are not being honest about so, what, what's yeah. in the literature. So I would say that right there is the magic of what I've been, a ple it's been such a pleasure being part of with you for these last two months or so, that you're giving people a little bit of op all of these people know something's not right. The mm. information we're getting is not right. The language we're speaking is not right. The way we're talking about government is not right. Everything that Eric just said right there, and you're giving them a little room every day to figure it out for themselves. Well, I mean, there's that, maybe, that strikes maybe there's me two the, things that yeah. are happening. One is because of the long form, it's actually possible to have more in-depth discussions about these things. And the other is that because my lectures, let's say, and the discussions that I've been having focus on the development of ideas rather than on the ideas themselves, that mm -hmm. that gives people a bit of breathing space. Um, one of the questions that I'm really curious about is, um, and I'd, I'd like to know what you think about this, is what do you think it is that's fundamentally driving the radicalness of the left? Like what? Because it, it does seem so counterproductive, even to, to the left's own stated positions, you know, because when I was in Aspen, for example, <clears throat> I talked about the literature on biological differences between men and women in, in psychology, right? It's like mostly men and women are similar, even in the dimensions where they differ most, there's way more overlap than there is difference, right? So aggression is a good example um, of that. So if you take a random man and a random woman out of the population and you had to bet on who was the more aggressive, if you bet on the man, you'd be right 60% of the time, but that's not that much. But then all the actions at the tails, right? So you don't care about how av aggressive the average person is, you care about how aggressive the really aggressive people are, and they're all male, and so you end up putting them in prison, which accounts for the massive differential between men and women in prison rates. And so you can have small differences at the mean and radical differences at the extremes. So, and that's the fact that people don't understand that is, e is partly willful blindness on the part of the ideologically committed, but also partly because it's somewhat com complex statistically. But then I think about the, like the audience that I was addressing at Aspen, they weren't happy about me talking about biological differences in personality between men and women. And I thought, well, what the hell do you want exactly mm -hmm. from your leftist perspective? Is like, why is it so necessary for you to make the presumption that there cannot be any differences whatsoever between men and women? It's like, well, first of all, there are, so that's a big problem for your theory, but why all of a sudden has this become an axiomatic position of the left that these differences can't exist, when what you want to do in principle is free up people to make choices, I think, that are to make choices in a market that would allow for those choices in keeping with their intrinsic nature. Like, why did that, I don't understand why that shifted. And what's interesting is you're talking about the intellectual liberal elite. That's the type of people you <laughs> mm. were talking in front of, right? It's not, right. That you were, it's not that you were just talking in front of just a group of lefties or a group of no. righties or, or anything no, else. No, 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 no. You were this talking was, about, you know, the primo This is the, the commentariat. No, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Look. So what, what do you do with that? Well, look, let me come straight at it. We on the left had an idea that if we could get rid of cultural bias in IQ testing, if we could get rid of misogyny that was structural in the workplace, that we would get a particular kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. And we did make things better in many ways, mm -hmm. but it didn't go as far as we were expecting. Mm -hmm. 
And so this is what people are wrestling with. And you know, I hesitate to call it this, but I think it's the most powerful way of saying it. It's the great oppression shortage of 2018. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that there still is structural oppression. I mm -hmm. mean, yes. look at Robert Moses' design uh, of New York City's uh, highways, bridges, and byways, um, famously uh, trying to keep buses from going to Jones Beach. I guess, is it Jones yeah, Beach? Yeah, no, to Jones Beach. He literally, I mean, I grew up on Long Island. The, bus, the, the bridges going over the LA at that area are lower because they didn't want buses right, bringing people from the inner city. the bridge spills out uh, yeah. into Harlem so that it doesn't affect real estate prices somewhere else on the east side. So, you know, th there really is structural oppression mm -hmm. the way there was when there were literacy tests uh, for voting which were constructed so that no black person could, could pass because it was impossible. Okay, but there's less of it now. And there's not enough of it to explain some of the differences. And the, the great fear is, is that the left program to try to produce better representation, better opportunities for women, for minorities, whatever, is going to stall out if we start to think of these things as differences. So okay, so why is it a problem? If, okay, fair enough. Look, why is it a problem if it stalls out, though? Is it because... There's all sorts of radical activists who then don't have anything to do, or is there well, a deeper problem? That's part of it. That's what you're seeing with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Oh, yes. Which, which is that you have an institution that fundamentally uh, accomplished much of its mission, but then it still had a large kitty and, and idle, idle hands. Mm -hmm. yep. and, Sounds like humanities departments to me. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we can get to that. Yeah. But I also want to steel man the other position yeah. so that you have something to fight against or, or, to, rec or to wrestle with. If I think about... I do something different with women in the workplace with respect to trying to figure out what is unfair to them, because there are things that are very unfair to them. And one of the things I do is to say, tell me about the great ideas of females and the great contributions that are sitting there on the table, in part because they had a female discoverer, right? So you could look at you know, Vera Rubin's work in... Uh, which never, you know, never got a Nobel Prize. Everybody knows about it in, in astrophysics. But I went through one of these things with my wife, where we did this thing with gauge theory and economics in the Harvard Economics Department. And I think it was one of the most sensational breakthroughs in um, mathematical and bedrock uh, economic theory in the last 25 years. And I'll t just be very clear. Every time people want to figure out how to tax Americans more and cut their benefits, um, without paying the price of touching the so-called third rails of politics, they realize that the CPI indexes both tax receipts and entitlements, so payments like Social Security and Medicare. And if you can show that the CPI is overstated, then the idea is that you get to take in more tax revenue and you get to pay old people and sick people less. And so it's a very popular game in Washington. Mm -hmm. To gerrymander the measurement. To gerrymander the measurement. Mm -hmm. Now, the two ways that you do that... Um, one is, is that you go from a fixed basket where you have, uh, let's say, basketballs and glasses, and you figure out what the price of that basket is over time, to something which is, what is the utility? So the idea is maybe I want slightly more glasses or basketball. You could do it with coffee and tea. I'm willing to trade off some amount of coffee uh, for some amount of tea to get my caffeine fix if there's a problem or an, a bumper crop in Brazil. Okay. The other thing you do is, is that you keep updating these baskets, and that's called chaining. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do both of those things together because there's a, a presumed impossibility result that you can't have a true cost of, a chain cost of living index, except that my wife and I solved that problem in the mid-1990s, at the same time that the Boskin Commission was trying to back out a, an exact 1.1% overstatement because that would save a trillion dollars. So in other words, you have to understand, they were given the task, go find a 1.1% overstatement and justify it so that we can cut uh, benefits and raise taxes. And my wife got in the middle of that bank robbery uh, as it was being attempted, and so she got thwacked. Now, I wanted to fight these sons of bitches. Absolutely. In particular, there's a professor named Dale Jorgensen who spearheaded the attempt to uh, really crush her uh, when, when she was on the, she was getting her dissertation. This is great work. And the cost of it, Jordan, is, is that there's great work done by women that is sitting there because fundamentally the women don't want to fight the way you and I would fight for our hmm. work. Hmm. Because it's not necessarily fun. It's unpleasant. And you know, with me, 
I have a very aggressive response to this. It's mm -hmm. like, how dare you talk about my work? Do you know how much better my work is than your work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. let's do this. Now, I well, got that, Well, that, that's, a, that, that's a complicated thing, too, because, you know, for, for a piece of brilliant work to rise up to the point where it's universally acclaimed, it takes a lot more than merely the brilliant work. That's it's the like point. An, it's like it's like putting a product out into the marketplace, like a consumer product. You might have a brilliant product, but the fact that you have a brilliant product is about five percent of what you need to have a successful product, because the rest of it is sales and marketing. And then, if so, you might say there's many ideas that we haven't right. taken stock of that we should have taken stock of. Those that we have taken stock of are this weird combination of brilliant idea plus brilliant and forceful marketing plus luck. All right. And so, so if 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 it's the case, for example, that because women are less assertive, they're less likely to fight those ideas forward, although equally likely to generate as many brilliant ideas, then that's going to cause a decrement in their movement forward. Well, and we need to contend with well, that. Well, that's what I'm trying to say, which is that fundamentally, the reason I ask for, don't tell me about the women being suppressed, tell me about the ideas of women so I can, I can use my aggress. As long as we have mm -hmm. a male-dominated system, mm -hmm. You have men who want to fight for great ideas. Mm. It's good. Well, but then the question is, do we have a male-dominated system or do we have a dominance-dominated okay. system? Right. Well, so this is, right. let, me, let, me, let me tease this apart. I have been in, I think, five almost all male fields. Um, I've, I've, I've touched mathematics, theoretical physics, uh, economics, finance, and uh, tech. And they're not all male, but they're do male-dominated fields. One of those fields I found had a cancerous attitude towards women that was just visible. So I got a chance to see in finance all of the bad behavior that people talked about, about the objectification, about um, you know locker room talk, which was just absolutely natural. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. in every mm -hmm. context, mm -hmm. but it was often enough. In the other fields in general, like in math, I, I don't think I ever heard people making nasty comments about women. So mm -hmm. in the same weird way. It's not like I'm deaf to it, because I can hear it in one case. I didn't hear it very often in the other case. Mm -hmm. In physics, I didn't hear many nasty comments about women, but it was incredible. Particle theory, for a period of time, was incredibly aggressive. Like, labor economics was super aggressive. Symplectic geometry inside of math was super female friendly. So there is definitely this difference in texture between um, the, these different places in male-dominated fields. And having seen relatively benign male-dominated fields and hypertoxic male-dominated mm -hmm. fields, I can tell you that I don't love going into a particle theory seminar where everybody's peacocking, mm -hmm. because it's, it's relatively uninteresting relative to the work. Mm -hmm. Well, you would say to some degree that would indicate that the, that the system has become somewhat corrupt in the ways that systems can be corrupt, and that what's pushing you forward in those fields is less about competence and more about let's I say dominance. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know either. But you could you could you could you could generate that as a hypothesis. But I'll, I'll tell you one of the things our psychometric work has revealed. This is quite interesting. Is when we've looked at differences in men and women with regards to outcome, and then controlled for personality. Right. The personality differences almost always obliterate the gender differences, mm. which means it's actually not a gender difference, it's a personality difference. Okay, but let's flip that, because this is... It this isn't is, always the case. No, no, I understand that. So I think that that's very important, but now you're going to get... Because I could say then the, the ideas of agreeable men yes. in these fields might be as likely to I be... Totally agree yeah. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Now, here's, here's the next part of it. Many... Let's, say, let's, let's not do it as male-female. Let many agreeable people have the idea that the problem is, is that the fields are so tilted towards disagreeability. Now, mm -hmm. I don't happen to believe this. Mm -hmm. That we are losing good ideas because agreeable people can't make progress. Mm -hmm. And in those mm -hmm. circumstances, the claim isn't, let's just have an open competition and see what rises to the top. Yeah. It's, let's change the structure of things. Yeah. Now, this... Yeah. Okay, so there's a problem with that. So let, let me let's, point out another psychometric out. problem with that. Okay, if you look at what predicts success in workplaces, generally what predicts is IQ and conscientiousness. Agreeableness is a very trivial predictor. Now, one of the things you do see is that agreeable people tend to get paid less for the same work. But we don't know why that is exactly. We don't know if they don't bargain as well. 
I think that's the simplest explanation is that they're, 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 it's easier to take advantage of agreeable people. It's almost like the definition of agreeable. It's the downside of being agreeable. But agreeableness is not a very good predictor of workplace success. There's actually a corrupt literature that's associated with this because there's a whole literature on emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence puts you ahead in the workplace. It's like, no, it doesn't. Emotional intelligence is almost in, indiscriminable from trait agreeableness. And trait agreeableness actually puts you behind in the, especially in the managerial domain. Now you might say, well, that means the managerial domain is prejudiced against agreeable people. But then there's some evidence that disagreeable people make better managers. And the reason for that is that they can't be pushed around. Because, you know, if you're a manager, you might say, well, what you have to do is you have to deal with the concerns of your employees. And that would be the agreeable interpretation. But sometimes if you're a manager, you have to take the slackers and give them hell. Yeah. And that's, a, that's something that only a disagreeable person can do. Well, this is the thing. So, but there isn't much evidence on the psychometric front that agreeableness... Um, that, that agreeableness is a, is a major contributor to workplace success in general. So it isn't obvious to me from the psychometric work that the idea that hierarchies in general are contaminated by a preference for disagreeable people, I don't see any evidence for that. Well, look, part of the problem with this whole discussion is, is that you have, there are roles in which agreeability works. There's, you can have a yes. team where there's, you need a certain balance of these things. Yes, it probably works for customer service, for example, to be agreeable. Right. And, and so, maybe for, for care, of, the, for pe care right. of people. So all of these things, I mean, the world didn't come up with um, big five traits uh, and distribute us across them uh, if, they, if they don't have advantages. Like, right. You're, you're, are you Absolutely. colorblind? No, but I my am. father is, and he can, he, can, he can see animals in the bush better well, that's than me. The, that's what I was going to make the point, is that mm -hmm. from my perspective, you're contrast blonde. Right. Right? And the idea is that when I'm talking about this, that strikes color normal people as very strange way. Well, that's a strange way to look at the world. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that these traits are retained because they have different uses. Now, yes, if, that's right. That is the fact. If you focus on the right tail of the distribution, the extreme right tail, if you hang out with billionaires, very often, in order to get to billionaire status, you have to be able to oppose large numbers of people and say they're all wrong and I'm right. Mm -hmm. and, and then you also have to be right. And you have to be <laughs> right. That helps. Which, is a, which is even worse, it's right? You have to be right it's, it's and you have to be disagreeable. That's absolutely right. But, you know, if I look at some of the things that, that my friend Peter Thiel can do that I, I find very few people can, it's like, can you hold a position? Even if you know two years from now you're going to be proven right with two years of scorn, yeah. the average person is going to Can't crumble. Yeah. Well, and that yeah. would also be partly trait neuroticism. Well, this is is that is people have to be able to tolerate that level of stress. And that's very, very difficult. And this is what I'm trying to get at, which is that people are looking at various reward structures and they're saying, well, that doesn't match my particular set of traits and yeah. I feel that my traits are valuable and those traits probably are valuable, yeah. but we are not all destined to become Beyonce okay. or Peter Thiel okay. but what or Jordan seems, well, But what seems to be happening, that, that's exactly right, that's exactly right, but what seems to be happening, I think, like if you look at the Scandinavian countries, the, the more egalitarian Scandinavian countries, that's where you're getting the most radical assortment of occupational status by gender. And so I would say, for example, that if you tilt towards agreeableness, which is actually a pretty good predictor of interest in people rather than interest in things, the biggest difference between men and women seems to be an interest. Right. Men are reliably more interested in things and women more reliably interested in people. The difference is one standard deviation. So it's a big difference. Right. And what seems to be happening in the Scandinavian countries is people are sorting themselves by their temperament which is what they should do, because your, your temperament, as you just pointed out, predisposes you to success in some realm and not in others, right? You don't get both. And failure. And, well, yes, and failure. So because women are on average more agreeable and perhaps higher in negative emotion, it isn't obvious how that fits into the equation, they're more sensitive to the distress of others and more likely to be compassionate in their care. So what happens? You open up the landscape of competitiveness to women, they immediately dominate the healthcare fields. And that's exactly what's happened. Now, and part of the problem with that is that healthcare as an occupation doesn't scale well, like engineering does, for example. And so it's very difficult to generate large fortunes in healthcare. And that's one of the things that skews the gender distribution of wealth. But it looks like if we left people be to the degree that we can, they would sort themselves into occupations by temperament. And that might be the yeah, best solution for everyone. It's a question of, like, when, when we had our first child, 
we had a, rot uh, a practice where there was a rotation of the OBGYN who'd deliver. We had this one woman who we were totally on the same page with. We loved her. Everything about her was fantastic. We were, we were simpatico. And my wife's labor went on and on and on and on. We, supposedly, we were getting closer and closer. Finally, she, this woman couldn't take it anymore, and she said, I got to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And the guy that we dreaded, the six foot mm -hmm. four guy with the bow tie who came from a totally different era, we called him the Undertaker, mm -hmm. comes in and he says, She's completely blown. Uh, where we are in the process, you're barely dilated at all. We we need to deliver this child immediately via cesarean. Mm -hmm. It's like, huh? What? Right. Well, this son of a bitch saved the situation for my for my my wife and my daughter. Yep. And yep. the idea is, I didn't like him one. Bit. Absolutely, man. That right? happens. And that the guy, wo was... the woman who diagnosed our daughter with with uh, arthritis, same yeah. thing. I was really mad at her. Really mad at her. She was very disagreeable, and she was right. And let's yeah. let's be very. Clear. Compassion and right are not the same well, this thing. this is the thing. The woman who, the reason that we didn't have ba flipper babies for thalidomide commonly in the United States was one woman who I think went to the University of Chicago at like 16, and she stood up and said, I don't like the data on this drug, and I don't, you know, I don't think you drug companies have done enough to prove to me that this is safe to prescribe mm -hmm. to pregnant women. And she just put up her hand and stopped it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what you... I'm going to use son of a bitch. That mm -hmm. son of a bitch saved how many? Mm -hmm. I mean, she's a national hero. Right, right. And we mm -hmm. should be celebrating yeah. it. But the, yeah. the issue is, is that it's not down to health care, agreeable or disagreeable. The problem is, is that we now have so much information about ourselves and about the occupations and the reward structures. And there is a lot of structural unfairness and there is a lot of unfairness about here's your endowment and you, you were given different gifts. And then there's a certain amount of luck. Mm -hmm. that we are all struggling with the idea that we have so much information and not enough oppression to explain this, and we're not necessarily happy with the outcome, we don't necessarily no, we... want to have an honest conversation okay, okay. about it. Well, so then, okay, so there's another element to that, too, which is, okay, the, the, the question might be, to what degree are we required to tolerate a certain amount of ineradicable suffering? Because that's the argument you're basically making. You're saying, look, we can, we can equalize and we can provide opportunity. And we've done, we've hit the point of diminishing returns. Now, not everywhere, obviously, and, and not in every sector, but you could make the case that we've hit the point of diminishing returns. And still, there's a tremendous amount of inequality and suffering. It's like, and we don't find that acceptable. It's yes, yeah, but the problem is the more you push to remove that last bit of ineradicable suffering, uh -huh. the more likely you are to produce a, a worse kickback in another place. That's not an easy thing to contend well, with. And the fact is that we're going to be discussing this, whether or not NBC, CBS, or ABC likes it, and they can't do anything about shutting this conversation down until YouTube or Twitter you know, really decides to get heavy-handed and give us the boot. And so fundamentally, we don't sound like what we're supposed to sound. Does this sound like an alt-right conversation? Does it sound hyper-conservative? No. It's a very difficult picture, and the key mm -hmm. problem mm -hmm. is, is that the only place it's being explored mm -hmm. is in these super luxurious, long-form interviews. I have no idea how people tune in. Like when, when we went to Tempe, people were tracking these conversations at a level that we're not tracking mm -hmm. these yeah, conversations. Know, know. Because incredible. the hunger they care. It, they actually care and about the And the they know that the cognitive Lego they've been handed is not capable of getting well, look, in surgically. Look and what's happening at Harvard. This is such an yeah. ex interesting example about, about, about the entire landscape. It's like the upshot, it looks like the upshot of the, um, of the policies designed to produce something approximating equity or at least equality of opportunity. The gerrymandering of the uh, admissions process has halved the number of Asians at Harvard. And then Harvard's, of course, denying that strenuously. And they say, well, our selection method is too esoteric to be captured properly by the statistics. It's like, oh, that's really how you're going to do this. There's nowhere. There's nowhere. Mm. It, it, the Harvard math department, I think, had one female mathematician. I think it doesn't have a senior female mathematician now. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Yeah. And I'm sure that the, that the university is trying to put pressure. Hey, what's wrong with you guys? Mm -hmm. Get with the program. Well, the National Science Foundation is trying to do that across the entire STEM disciplines now. And they're really going to muck up math by, by playing around with this. Because the data show, it's quite interesting, the data show that um, if you look at junior high, there's approximately, there's some dispute about this. There, there still might be evidence that there's a small percentage of 
uh, small ad advantage to men at the highest levels of mathematical ability. But I'll leave that aside for now. The more ge general data show that there's plenty of gifted women and there's plenty of gifted girls, there's plenty of gifted boys. But the gifted boys are gifted in math and not verbally, whereas the gifted girls in math are gifted verbally too. And so one of the consequences is that because math is a very specialized subject, Their opportunity costs are higher. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. The girls decide not to pursue well, math. Well, and the thing is, is that so. math perfectly well tolerates the females that it understands their work and can't live without. I mean, if I think about Emmy Nurder or Karen Uhlenbeck or Dusa McDuff, there's a huge number of women who are very well integrated uh, you know, physics people like Lisa Randall. I, I, I don't even think about there being women mathematicians or women physicists. Mm -hmm. It's just like that result, this paper. Right. Right. And the yeah, idea. So thank God for that. Right. But the, the the point that I'm trying to get at here is is that there are still structural barriers, mm -hmm. and there's probably something that isn't a structural barrier, like for example, you know, the incentive structures. Mm -hmm. And if the pay keeps going down, my guess is that you'll get more females in which is a per totally perverse effect that's been studied, um, that you start going into the female and minority uh, sectors when m men feel that they have higher uh, opportunity costs based on their level of aggression that they can go into management consulting or Wall Street. Right, so right. There's well, all that's these a complica major complication. But the key question is, we need to be able to have the real conversation mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it needs to not well, we get... also need to have a conversation about why it might be advantageous to be paid less. One of the reasons it's, it's advantageous to be paid less is the demands are less on you. So if you have other things that you want to do with your right. life, then taking right. a job that pays less. This happens in law all the time, all the time. I worked as a consultant to, for legal companies, for, for law firms for 10 years with lots of high-end women. And I saw the same thing happen all the time. It, and the law, the law firms know this right to the core. And all the women in the law firms know it too. Almost all the women bail out of the high-end positions in law in their early 30s. Well, why? Well, it's partly because if they're making, say, they're making three hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars a year, they're charging a thousand dollars an hour. Well, the workload is absolutely insane. You better be billing twenty three hundred hours a year, right? If you're going to stay in that position, and you're on call all the time, and you're basically working sixteen hour okay. days. But so maybe, maybe what you want to do instead is find a nine to five job that pays half as much, but you get to have okay, a life. It's more psychotic inside the universities. And here's what, here's what nobody really wants to discuss. The great danger, according to many of my colleagues in well-placed well placed in, in high-level uh, science departments, is they say the following. We don't know which females are going to discover the pleasures of family mm -hmm after we've invested in them. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, is that sometime in their mid-30s, some number of, uh, of women, they think, discover, oh my God, I've never been so fulfilled as mm -hmm. when I've had my child. And some mm -hmm. women say, I can't wait to get back to the lab, right? Mm -hmm. And these are two different reactions. Mm -hmm. So by pushing the point of commitment farther and farther towards mm -hmm. middle age, mm -hmm. what you're doing is, is that you're actually screening out the fact that you don't know which people you're going to invest in and are going to decide that they have something more interesting to do in their life in terms of kin work or that compel them well, more and, and because and, and kin work be also has to do with aging parents, mm -hmm. right? Now, right. the yes, fact yes. is is that women are more conscientious with respect to child rearing and with aging parents generically than men. Mm -hmm. And so part of the game... Probably a function of being agreeable. Probably a function of fitness, where yes, uh, yes, you know the idea is that uncertain mater uh, uncertain paternity and certain maternity means that in a highly case selected species, females are going to be ever more focused on on on, on kin in this way. Maybe that's the reason that the differences in agreeableness evolved. I, I, I'm not. not I've never thought about that. I'm that not could, well, that could be. I never thought about that. It's as a, likely as an explanation, explanation but, right? Mm -hmm. But the issue that fundamentally we would defer tenure as a means of screening out um, females who are going to invest in fertility. Now, it's very interesting. If you look at feminist uh, scientists in the 50s, you have women who like had four kids, and they spent a life in science. And very often, you, you, look, you poke and prod at these things. Well, there was an army of uh, servants, because there was wealth in the family, you know, very right. often. Right, right. And so right. what, what I, my claim is, if you really want to do something profound for women in technical subjects, mm -hmm. you should pay them more 
and you should get them help in the house. Mm -hmm. Didn't work in law. Well, this is the issue because mm -hmm. to some extent it's a question of fulfillment. Because most of them, most of the women that I worked with, they all had nannies. They outsourced all their domestic d duties. Like that was covered, man, and that was part of well, the Well, let me tell you, but it still didn't you know a more them. successful group of people than I do because mm -hmm. very well, often they had the money for well, it. Well. If, you, if when two people can't get jobs together in contiguous states, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, I, I've got a job in Oklahoma and he's got a, a job in Alabama and we try to see each other two weekends right, a right, month, right, right, right. you know, th things have gone wildly off the rails. But yes. the key point is that employers are playing games trying to figure out this change in the life cycle where some women are very, very happy doing kick-ass work throughout their life Maybe they can figure out how to do it all. Some of them can, some of them can't. Yeah, it's pretty hard to do it's it all. It's pretty hard to do it yeah, all. It, it helps is, if yeah. you have money. It does. It does help. But we are not owning up to what are, what are these games and what are these differences well, and where should, we be, where should we be subsidizing? We're, we're also not owning up to the fact that the gender difference in pay isn't a gender difference. It's a mother difference. Because women take the big hit in their salaries when they decide to have kids, well, and not, so it isn't it's not women. Just that. No, it's not just that. But that no, one, and nothing is hardly okay. anything is ever <laughs> just one thing. Right, right. But, but the whole thing about equal pay for equal work and seventy-five cents on the dollar, mm -hmm. right, is that when you poke and prod at that, there is an unfairness and there is a misrepresentation. And the point is, we're not comfortable having the open conversation about. Do we want to subsidize people based on this difference? Now, my mm -hmm. wife has a really interesting point. And she said, look, I believe in the Fisherian equivalence between male and female as strategies where males tend to be the high risk, high return, yeah. moderate risk, moderate return. Mm -hmm. And there was a time mm -hmm. when, when wars were common and men got called up and women didn't have as high end prospects and everybody was working the fields or you know w washing clothes at home. And then her point is really interesting is Knowledge work became wildly more fulfilling very quickly, and the number of wars, and this is my addendum to it, has gone down. And so suddenly, it's much better to be male in her way of thinking than it is female in a way that was never true before. And so that there is a novelty effect, which is that um, knowledge work is outpacing the fulfillment of child rearing at some level because the, the problems that you can d solve if you're well placed to do so, uh, have increased in number and they're very, very fulfilling. Mm. And, and they're also disproportionately lucrative, at least in some situations. And they're disproportionately lucrative. Mm. And so I, I do think that one of the things we have to do, um, you know, lo look at the Vietnam uh, War Memorial, and the, I think there are like eight female names on it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, George, Tom, Chad, you know. Right, right. 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 So there is this forgetting of the fact that. Maleness has this huge downside, which and, is the high risk part of the high risk well, high return thing, strategy. Right? And you know your point about interest in things over people. Mm -hmm. um, at my local pinball well, the, arcade also, in San Francisco, which, you know, uh, I take my son there. There's a fe there's a women's room, and there are clearly pinball machines that are intended to get a female audience. But it's like twenty to one. Males to females yeah, yeah. because it's it's this kind of robotic activity well, where you're just putting money into a machine and you're watching a ball and some flashing lights. Mm -hmm. I find it quite entertaining, mm -hmm. but I look at myself and I think you're saying chicks. Man, don't. I'm out of my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting too is that that high risk, high return strategy is also not that common among men. It's just that the people who do the high risk, high return uh -huh. strategy are disproportionately men. And so one of the things that I've been trying to struggle with is that. Like there's a small number of people who are hyper productive in any right. discipline. That's the Price's Law phenomenon. So you see, for example, in scientific publishing, the median number of publications for men and women is very similar. The median number, but the the people who pu who hyper publish are almost all men. Yeah, the Telemons of uh, right. of science, exactly. For or, or that's right, the JS Box of science, right? right? And 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 then the painful part of that is is that. It's the people, it looks like it's the people who are hyperproductive that drive the science forward. So the median types are actually somewhat irrelevant. Yeah, it's only the hyperproductive people that count. Yeah, but, and they're disproportionately men. But even men. then, you said, you know, I've heard you on this yeah. point, I want to take issue. Yeah. You know, is Kurt Gödel hyperproductive, or was he? And I would say, yes, he was. Did he publish very much? Almost nothing. Well, quantity isn't the best no, no, index no, 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 of quality, that, but, but it's become, a pretty good one. I don't think so. It's correlated at point three with citation count, independent of number yeah, of publications. Yeah, but citation count is. All, I know. We, I know. We've got we, we've got a really dangerous problem 
in that the metrics that we've developed, we've put way too much on. And the, you well, know, that's that's the you could say that that's a universal problem. Be careful what you measure, right? And I mean, it's careful. hard to measure scientific impact with any degree well, but of this credibility. Is why, this is why I'm so un unpopular in this area, which is I just believe in giving slush funds to highly disagreeable people of high achievement <laughs> and saying, go figure out who you want to fund, because yeah. a lot of this stuff can't be justified yeah, 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 yeah. by any metric. And by the way... Well, that's why I'm big on the selection end of things. Well, well, should you so should select qualified people and leave them the hell alone. Well, I mean, I... You guys should I be working hope, together on this. I mean, my, my take on this is that the best way to get radical progress is stop worrying about the median individual, mm -hmm. worry about the tiny number of people who break new ground for everybody, yes. and then you find those... That's a hell who, of a thing for a leftist to say. But I mean, this goes Stay back. Stay tuned. Well, it goes back. It goes back to the problem I laid out at the beginning: is that if you're going to pursue things of value mm -hmm. in a social environment, you're going to produce a hierarchy, and there's going to be hyper productivity at the pinnacle of the hierarchy. It's a big problem. But if you want to produce things, that's the problem you have to contend with. And so it is the case that in in most fields that are attempting to advance rapidly, that it's a very tiny proportion of people who are doing the advancing. And how could it be otherwise? Well, but because otherwise you, everybody would you be doing them? the advancing. So you know, I have this trick. Well, which IQ is, is a good measure. Well, here's another one. Uh, you ask the leaders in the field uh, effectively who they would block, but they will not publicly short. So in other words. Yeah, uh, uh, Joe's on some crazy tangent. Uh, he's wasting the, the, the department's resources. Or, you know, Jane fundamentally uh, doesn't play well uh, uh, on this team, and uh, I think we need to send her a strong message. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why don't we say something publicly? But, no, no, I don't want to say that. Well, why is it mm. that you don't want to say something? Well, because you're frightened that that person has you on the losing end of history. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to block that person in private but I you see. won't short them in public. Right, right, right. So you use the people who fundamentally are the regular establishment to tell you who the most dangerous people are. Mm -hmm. And you get those people money and you, you try to decrease transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. Because giving people freedom, the old part of this bargain was it's not the best paid career in the world. But you do end up with freedom that's and the right. ability to the, wield the, the middle bargain. finger. Yeah, and that's gone. And that's, that's gone. That's, the ethics committees have killed that. Well, that's and, my point. Is, is that bureaucracies have killed. It's gone. Okay, it's so gone, we, man. But it is our job to rally for unaccountability at a mm. very high level. Lack of transparency. You can laugh, but let's, let's go through this. Mm. Right? The fact is, when you have a slush fund and you can make decisions, that you don't have to justify based on an H index or a citation count or any of these poison metrics. You get people who are able to make use of what we still have over places like China. Mm -hmm. That's what right. we have over a place like China is we're a little bit richer, not much yeah. maybe. Yeah. So but we we're can, freer. But we're freer. Yeah, and that right. middle finger, that's that blessed middle finger. Well, that's disagreeableness there again. Well, I know. And I mean, you were the one who accused well, me over dinner. Of, see, this of, is also why tenure is necessary, because you could say, well, um, 95, per, I don't believe this, but you could say 95% of people waste tenure. They take advantage of it. And I would say that's fine as long as the 5% who aren't taking tenure. advantage of it have their freedom, yeah, because they're going to hyperproduce and justify all the rest of yeah, that Yeah, but expense. nobody has real tenure, because real tenure and academic freedom was first of all sacrificed by the Association of American Universities, AAU, in 1953 at the height of the Cold War in the face of the Rosenbergs. Mm -hmm. So first of all, let's be very, very honest. The trade group that represents the nation's top institutions of higher learning, the research universities, fucked up. And they killed something, and I don't swear very often. This is very important. They sacrificed academic freedom on an altar when they were facing something like we're, we're facing with left McCarthyism, mm -hmm. all right, when they were facing real McCarthyism, they buckled. And the Einsteins of the world stood up. There's a beautiful testimony of a guy who was facing Senator McCarthy. Uh, he says, well, I was just talking to my friend Albert Einstein. You can see in the transcript, he's like, excuse me, your friend Albert Einstein? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Einstein said, look, you have to be prepared to lose your salary, lose your livelihood, if you're going to be a true intellectual. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact of the matter is disagreeability needs to make a massive, roaring comeback, right? And one of the things I think is just fascinating is how many top departments have invited Brett Weinstein to give a talk on evolutionary theory after watching him tossed out by the radical departments? I suspect the answer to that is zero. It's almost 
zero. I don't know that it may be zero. So but this is so with Lindsay Shepard, her claim for with Wilfrid Laurier is that the controversy is, controversy has made her permanently unemployable. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I thought that's that's correct because no hiring committee will yeah. take a risk but, on but anybody let's look touched at by scandal. Mm -hmm. who did green fluorescent protein. Uh, he was supposed to get a Nobel Prize for it. He was acknowledged by the three guys who did as the fourth guy. They flew him to Sweden. And what is he doing? He, you know, immediately afterwards, he was driving a shuttle bus in Huntsville, Alabama. One year later, after the New York Times uh, covered Doug Prasher's story, he was still driving a shuttle bus in Huntsville, yeah. Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about Margot O'Toole at MIT, yeah. who stood yeah. up against David Baltimore and uh, Theresa Imanishikari, you know, destroyed. Now, my question is, hey, where are the universities? Is it the University of Chicago? Is it down to the University of Chicago? Where are the places? Chicago, if you're out there, you know, we, we need you. We mm. need fundamentally strong departments and weak administrations. This is absolutely critical. Is that mm. thing on? That's on. Mm. Okay. We need unaccountability. We need strong professors. We need strong departments. We need weak administrations. We need to get people tenure radically earlier, like in their 20s, late 20s, early 30s. We need when people have the ability to make great new ideas. This is not appreciated. And the fact that fundamentally nobody can hear Brett Weinstein, who has great interesting theories, and you want to shoot him down, by all means. But you won't invite him to give a seminar on his on his work at a time like this. This is absolute madness. And I'm so, you know, just what a privilege to be able to deal with our tiny group of people who can actually open their throat and well, say, he may, well, he that, may find a much larger audience than he would have got any other way. Well, that's so exactly what know. I was going to say. Yeah. Maybe hearkening this all the way back, and then let's do one more thing, and then we're going to bring in Shapiro. But maybe that brings us back to where we started about this, this speedening of technology, mm -hmm. the amount of people that can listen and watch and all of that, and that what Brett may find. I just brought Brett up in front of a sold-out comedy club in Bellevue, and he got a, when I just mentioned his name, he got a standing ovation. How many so, of those people edit journals of evolutionary theory? So we have to get it to them. I get mm -hmm. it. It's a different set that, that yeah, are watching this right now. There's something to be said. There's something to be said. Even So the publication the front is, is rough, but there's something to be said for being able to bring your scientific expertise to a mass audience who are actually interested in the content of your discourse. So I'm not saying it's, 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 it's the revolution in the journals that might mm -hmm. be necessary, but it's not nothing. It's, and it, 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 it looks like there's the possibility of bringing these things directly to a mass audience that's appreciated. Well, I appreciate that, but the thing that nobody gets about what we're doing, because I spend my time attacking uh, most of the things I'm trying to save. Um, I want to save the New York Times from itself. I want to save the university. How old are you? 52? No, you don't have enough time left to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a baby boomer, my friend. He might know Kurzweil, you know? <laughs> um, what we need to do is either cure it or kill it. Mm -hmm. um, these things need or to be... Or we can let it kill itself, which it seems to be hell bent on doing. Yeah, I don't have time for that. And, and, and it's not a pretty death. No. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that it's crowding out what's next. Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally, if it can be saved, if they can be saved, they need to be saved. And if they can't be saved, if they fundamentally want to keep their finger on the scales and push everything in this direction, and the cowardice is, uh, is palpable everywhere, um, it's important that they stop crowding out what's next. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that that's the major decision. And, you know, quite I frankly, think the, mar the marketplace might make that decision for them. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe it'll be fast. Maybe it'll be fast enough. So let's let's do one other thing before Shapiro is going to join us. We're going to take a little break and have lunch, and then Shapiro is going to jump in here. So I thought this would be a good segue to to him because we haven't done that much political stuff yep. right here. Is this is this a political movement? Is, is this the beginnings of a political movement? No, I, I I don't think so. I think what it is is the is the is the conduct. It's the conducting of proper political discourse. And maybe you could say, well, it would be a political movement to foster the conducting of proper political discourse. That's possible, but it's a strange right. political movement because it's a political movement that's concentrating on process rather than, 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 than content. Yeah. Um, I think that partly what I'm doing in my tour is the fostering of genuine discourse. But I don't think that's a political, I don't think of that as a political movement. I think of it as a psychological movement or, yeah, or, it. I don't know. 
are constitutional principles in the political domain? Uh -huh. I would say no, they're outside the political domain because they're axioms. So they're inside some other domain. They're inside a philosophical domain or a theological domain. And I think a discussion that's associated with proper political process isn't a political discussion. I think it's a meta-political discussion. So would, be, would a better way to ask the question then be, do we just need a political party or a political group or a politician or whatever to, to just pick up on this and then incorporate it? So that it's not a movement in and of itself. I understand what you're saying. Well, I've been. I went and talked to um, uh, what's the name of that group? Turning Point America. I went and talked to Turning Point USA. Yeah, yeah. Turning Point USA. I went and talked to their women's meeting. They had about 1,200 women down in. Uh, we were in Dallas, and one of the things I recommended to them was that instead of concentrating on the content of their ideology, because they're branding themselves in some sense as a conservative movement, that they devote themselves to educating themselves as much as they possibly can because they're going to produce a much bigger impact by becoming better individuals than they are by promoting conservative doctrine. That's what it looks like to me. Even though there's some utility in promoting conservative doctrine on the campuses, at least as a counterbalance to the overwhelming preponderance of radical leftist thinking. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think the fundamental movement necessarily necessary here is political because I think the political is actually part of the problem. So that's, that's how it looks to me. I think we're the advanced group set to, sent to take a hill for a healthy political discourse that follows us. Yes, and, that, that's, hopefully that, that would and, you be know, the situation. Taking Turning Point USA, uh, you know, I was shocked that Charlie Kirk and Tand Candace Owens reached out to me. And I was like, you, you, you do understand who I am. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm very confused by it because I find that a lot of the rhetoric that comes out of that absolutely unpalatable. Mm. And the private discourse is much more sympathetic, much more understanding. Mm. I think that the political I think some of that's a lack of sophistication, actually, on, on the part of the people who are doing it. But I think so, we can move those well, guys, because well, just for the record, I just want to say that when they invite me to speaking gigs, Charlie said to me from day one, he said, I disagree with you on a ton of stuff, but I want to invite you here to speak. Yeah. And I go up there well, and I talk about being gay, married, and pro-choice, yeah, and against the death penalty, confusing. and all of these things, and they give me a standing ovation. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. The, but then yeah. the problem is, is that nobody can figure out why I'm talking to Candace Owens, because when she's going in red meat conservative mode, sure. I don't recognize the same person who reached out to me and you know. Well, I don't think it is the same person exactly. I, I think that there's a fractionation there as well. Well, I understand but because of the niche and the idea is, is that there is not yet a niche. This came up with Douglas Murray, it's a super important point. Mm. In general, mm. people are in a restrictionist mood on immigration and they want more protectionism with respect to trade. Mm -hmm. And the question, like let's take with immigration, is why is it that no politician finds it easy to exploit um, this without going completely far right or completely open borders? Like either it's ethno-nationalism or it's uh, all people are equal, why should we discriminate from people in any other country? Right. And the sensible positions are uninhabitable. Uh -huh. yes. So the question is why? Yes. And so the claim that I'm making is you have to really know your stuff at the moment if you're going to hold a position like we cannot be xenophobic, we have to be somewhat restrictionist, we cannot close the borders, yeah. immigration, I mean, I particularly Well, you want, put your finger on it, you have to know your stuff to hold that position. But you shouldn't have to know it at this level. I mean, in other mm. words, the work I had to do to figure out what the hell happened with technical and scientific immigration is a hidden study from 1986 that nobody outside in the outside world knew about. Nobody can devote two years of their life generically yeah, yeah, in order yeah. to figure these things yeah. out. <laughs> and so the problem mm -hmm. is we have to actually take yeah. the ground for the middle, mm -hmm. get rid of the crazies on both ends, and have an idea that fundamentally... Or that at least the, stop the crazies from taking out the reasonable people. That's the issue. Well, the, I don't... Because stopping the crazies, that's like, well, probably not, because they're always there. But getting their hands from around the necks of the people who are sensible would be well, a useful, at least intermediary step. I, I have learned painfully that I have more in common with what would now be considered center-right than I do with radical left. Yeah. And so this idea of reaching across the aisle and saying, you, you take out your trash, I'll take out mine, yeah. right, is a very important move mm -hmm. that is not happening. And so, so that's but that's so one of the things that's weird about the, the, the Candace Owen Charlie Kirk situation is like when I went to the Aspen Ideas Festival, the people who invited me there 
I wouldn't say work. They're not canonical members of the commentariat. They're people who are feeling tremendous pressure, and that's partly why they invited me. And I did get invited, but, and then I discussed the things that I was discussing. But I wouldn't say that I felt welcome there at all. And so one of the things that's weird about going to talk to these conservative groups is like I went down to Dallas and I talked to these women and I like I didn't give a conservative talk. Right. I gave the sort of talk that I'm having right now. And but they were they were conservative. But at the same time, they were actually listening to what I was saying and they were receptive to it. And so then when I go to the talk to the leftist types, it's like that that. They're ideologically possessed, let's say, in the same manner, but they're not open at all. Okay, but, but I experienced something slightly different. I, I see exactly this. I am more welcome in center-right circles than I am in even center-left circles because of the contamination has gotten much farther from, from the extreme into the center yeah, and the left. Yeah. But there's still this other thing. Like, you know, I hear the word libtard, yeah. and I'm just like, oh, for Christ's sake, really? Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you want to enslave everybody. Oh, your monster turned on you. And I just think, okay, this is some pre-programmed set of moves. And, you know, in your comment section, there is much more of this stuff than I'm used to in, in other people's comment sections. Yeah, something comment about, sections are nuts. No, 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 mm -hmm. but I'm saying something about your audience. Yeah. That somewhere in your evolution, um, you have to watch the fact that there is this increase in the incivility on the right. And, you know, I focus my energy on the left because it's my responsibility. I don't think the right is my responsibility. Mm -hmm. But Well, these people are struggling with the same problem you laid out at the beginning, though. It's like, we can, we can make the case for civility and should. But, but you say, well, the civility only goes so far till you defend yourself. It's like, yeah, well, that's a big problem. It's like, exactly how far does it go? And then how do you defend yourself? And when you're defending yourself, what strategies do you use? Now, one of the things I learned, and I talked about this with Dave last night, and it's something I think that we should think about as members of this loose group, is that you, you don't defend yourself more than is absolutely necessary, right? It's a minimal necessary force, uh, Doctrine is the correct one and so libtard and that sort of thing could probably be shelved as ineffective and counterproductive Right, although part of the reason that it's coming up at least in part is an, an, an attempt to no, defend it's not ineffective and counterproductive It's offensive and stupid. Well, okay. We that that's fine. Right. That's fine. That's fine But but my point is it's actually it's actually technically complicated It's like it's not that easy to mount an effective defense that isn't simultaneously an attack. Like, uh -huh. you have to be very, like, I want to push you back just far enough so you're back, but no farther. It's like, and I mean, that's worked out in my situation so far, because generally when I've been attacked publicly in the press, even in interviews, right. I've been able to use minimal necessary force. And every time that's happened, it's worked. And so one of the things I would recommend, and this would be to your listeners and viewers, and perhaps to mine as well, perhaps to yours, is that don't push back any harder than you have to, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, it gets rapidly well, counterproductive. Do it in a balanced fashion. My, my typical thing is if somebody's going to come on gangbusters and I give them three opportunities or so to cut it out and they refuse to, I, you know. Yeah, I like the rule of three a lot. But like, mm -hmm. you, you've been then I smack yeah. them to the curb and then I offer them a hand up. Right, and then right, the key right, question right. is, mm -hmm. okay, you're going to bite the hand up, then, then we have a further problem because now you're just on some sort of unbounded... Mm -hmm. Uh, descent into hell, and I'm not interested mm -hmm. in following you there. Mm -hmm. But I think you know that what's really going on, and, and this is the, the 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 hardest point to make, is that we need two new sort of hermaphroditic parties that combine elements of right and left that don't look like the terrible situation that we inherited from the baby boomers. No offense, sir. Um, where for a very long period of time, we've been under one group. Uh, group set of ideas that are crashing and burning and whatever the new thing that replaces right and the new thing that mm -hmm. replaces left is mm -hmm. is going to have c combinations of these things mm -hmm. and so for example maybe situation specific well this is the thing well. like, I'm a more I differentiated am, every smart person I know is pro market the key question mm -hmm. is do you believe that the market should be allowed to do everything like you get these very purist things. Like I am the I'm an Ayn Randy, and I'm a guaranteed free marketeer. But then you put things in front of them, and you say, "Look, should physics be allowed to sign a, a licensing deal where we charge you for everything we've created, like the semiconductor, 
you know, or, or, or the communications equipment that you, mm -hmm. that you use to run your life. Because if you want to talk to me one more time about tax dollars for science, I'm going to point out to you that you're breaking a compact that we had that you were going to support us and we weren't going to charge, uh, charge you. Because if we charge you, we're going to be the ones in, with the yachts and the fourth homes and you're not going to be able to, to pay your physics bill. Mm -hmm. you know? And the point of this is um, when you welch on a contract and you start to say, no, 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 it's the market. Well, guess what? You know, public goods are part of markets and they're very valuable and they're hard to get anyone to pay for them. And so you have to use some amount of violence. Right? Mm -hmm. Weber's theory is that a government is a monopoly on violence, mm -hmm. and that's why it exists. When you have these very pure ideological positions that are not tutored by reality or deeper theory, they are very, very difficult to dislodge people from. Now, because you are taking a ton of risk as a small business owner, you are going to be predisposed towards a libertarian mindset because you're not only making money from your hard work, you're making money from the fact that you're taking on huge amounts of risk. And when people don't identify risk management as a source of inequality, mm -hmm. we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are a ton of people I know in New York who are making money hand over fist by extracting it through rent seeking, by putting themselves as the toll collector so that everybody who's got to do business has to pay them off in some sort of legalized form of corruption. And those people, I fundamentally think we should have clawed back their property on Long Island and, and, and come up with clawback national seashore. Uh, when we bailed them out in the uh, you know great re recession and, and collapse in 2008. Now, well, maybe we'll get lucky, and you know, and, and I'm thinking that that this is a possibility is that these increasingly long form uh, opportunities for communication and the rise of podcasts and the rise of audiobooks and all of that is going to produce a more educated and committed electorate and they will be sophisticated enough to start to sort out these problems without recourse to these ideological, or with less recourse to these ideological oversimplifications. They're still fighting us, Jordan. They're still, they're still not coming. I mean, the number of people I know who are privately aware of me and publicly show no mm -hmm. awareness of what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, uh, mm -hmm. I assume the same thing for you. Well, it's a running but it's joke. Tilting. It, it's, it's tilting. It's tilting fast, man. It was much more for you, I mean, because I think by breaking well, through... Well, someone with, has to get there first. No, no, I like you know, that. Yeah. Yeah. And you broke through with the book, and it was... You, you're doing a different thing than, than anybody else in this network is doing. But my point would be that they had to contend with you because they had a mystery, which is why is there a one, number one bestseller um, by somebody who's... I mean, how do we explain any amount of this? Well, Dave insisted well, I come to... It's because of all my angry young white men followers, <laughs> but those aren't the people who are buying well, the book. Well, this was the right? funny, you know, and I, I started taking pictures with all of the people of color and the, the Well, it's up to that, about, the talks are up to about 40% women now. And the at age least. Is, at least, at least. Yeah. The age, the one thing I do see, though, is that lots of men come alone, mm -hmm. but very few women come alone. But it's it's about forty percent women now. And Did I tell you about the group of grandmothers that I met? There no, was this no, group no. About a week or two ago, I forget what city it was, and there was this group of grandmothers yeah. that get together, and it was there was about nine or ten of them, and all in their sixties and seventies, mm -hmm. and they they all love you, and it was like, I'm oh yeah, go these on are Doctor Oz in September. Oh, then you'll get all so the that's grandmothers. Right. That's you'll get right. all the rest. That's of right. Them. Yeah. You know, I, one one kid came up to me in one of your talks, and I said, you know, he started talking about how important it was that you were there. And I said, well, what has this done for your life? He says, what hasn't it done for my life? Mm -hmm. He says, you know, I was, uh, I was at home smoking weed, masturbating too much, playing video games. And, you know, six months later, I've got a job, uh, a fiancé. Um, you, know, you know, I think he had some gal who was not interested in him because of his, his situation, but liked him. And yeah. he turned his life around. Yeah. And I thought... This is partly what's so incredibly fun about these events is yeah. that... People just tell that story over and over. It's so fun because they come up to me and they say, look, here's six months ago. I was having all these troubles and, and, and sometimes it's serious. I was suicidal. And yeah, but what, was really effect, what really affected me about this conversation was nothing about this guy said loser. Mm -hmm. And what, what it told me is, is that some of the difficulties we've had in our markets, uh, particularly after post-2008, like there was this thing that worked less and less well over time. And people who were college educated, who were hardworking, who were creative, were still living at home with mm -hmm. their parents. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an added kick. It's like, you know, when do you hit the nitrous oxide in order to get the car to zoom into hyperspace? Uh, 
I think, you know, I, before I ever met you, I had this shtick about the world uncle shortage, mm -hmm. and that fundamentally we needed a class of uncles and also aunts who aren't exactly parents to put a cigar in your mouth and a, a single malt in, 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 in your hand and say, listen, kid, this is how the world actually works. Mm -hmm. Get the hell out there and master it. Yeah, don't, don't, don't you bucko me. But the, the key <laughs> issue is, is that I think you became the one man answer to the world uncle shortage. And I think it's important at some point to deepen the offering because there are many different kinds. Like fundamentally, I need to not focus on cleaning my room uh, because I'm a messy room guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I need to get my physics out and I need to do certain sorts of things you know, to get my life in order that are different. Well, if you're not doing anything, you could start by cleaning your room. Mm -hmm. No, 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 I didn't. Mm -hmm. It's not bad advice. No, I know, I know. But it's also the case that we need sane, tough, funky ants because there's a lot of bad advice being given to women. Mm -hmm. And oh, if, well, a lot of this radical stuff on the left isn't going to be sorted out by men. If it's going to be sorted out, it's going to be sorted out by sensible women who put an end to it. And I'm hoping that will happen. Well, but I understand The sensible that. women that I've, that I've talked to who would like to do that are terrified, are terrified. of being shredded by I'm harpies. I'm so glad you said this. Oh, absolutely. I hear that over and over. And these are often women who are in positions of substantial power. You wouldn't think that they would be who, who are not terrified of this, but this they is are. The, this, is, this is what one of these women who will remain nameless said to me. She said, I've never been afraid of men. And I said, well, what are you afraid of? And we worked through it a little bit. And she said, I guess what I'm afraid of is weak women. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, <laughs> yes. What an interesting observation mm. that fundamentally, you, you know, strong people can say, that comment was a little sour. Yep. It doesn't have to be like, <gasps> yep. what did you say? Yep. You know, because very often, how many boneheaded comments? I make boneheaded comments. You make boneheaded. Mm. If, you, if people don't have a chance to play with ideas and to come back from it, if, ever, if the answer to That's everything it. is you're canceled. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, then. Then there's no hope. Well, then you're not. In, you're also just not inviting people to play yeah, with the ideas that you're actually right. interested well, then, in them adopting. Exactly if they right. can't play with them, if they're they never. If they can't gonna... be stupid in their initial formulations of the ideas, then they don't get to think. Right on the nose, sir. Mm -hmm. yes. On that note, I want to take my two uncles out to lunch. And then we will bring in my cousin, Ben Shapiro. How does that sound? Sounds sound good. good. Sound good. All right, guys. Yeah. So we're going to do the second live stream. Uh, this is going to end in a second. We're going to do the second live stream with Ben at 1 o'clock Pacific. And be nice in the comment section, because that's what your uncles want out of you guys. All right. We'll be back in a sec.